Well, we're going to be getting started in a minute or so. Well, welcome everyone. I would like to extend a profound welcome to you to be part of this um, initial conference and uh, philosoph philosophical theologies and uh, philosophy of religion in Africana traditions. Uh, I do hope that we will have a very productive a gathering both today and tomorrow when we meet at the Commons in Brooklyn. <laughs> but um, I know we will be able to have very, very interesting discussion and uh, different topics related to uh, Africana religions and uh, philosophy. So welcome. As stated in the original invitation to this conference, religions are cultural and personal guidance systems and so affect people in their daily lives. Consequently, we need to investigate how these systems of beliefs and practices are operational in institutions in which people participate. African descendant peoples are deemed to be, for the most part, extremely religious, and religion is involved in identity formation, uh, personal, communal, institutional, and national identities. Personal identity and individual salvation in relationship to collective action and institutional solidarity needs to be investigated. This position isolates the individual from the community by emphasizing that the human person is primarily and foremost answerable to a particular god, a guru, or a savior by suggesting that everyone in isolation from the community can experience divine grace or favor and the ground that a new beginning can be achieved by one's own effort separate and apart from everyone else. This is a key doctrine in Christian teachings that can be found also in Buddhism and Hinduism. There is a need for investigation into whether or not missionary Christianity influenced African traditional religions and consequently isolates the individual from the community and mitigates against communal solidarity and collective action. Emphasis on personal salvation may also result in the belief that human autonomy is sacrosanct, irrespective of whatever kind of social disruption that might result from acting primarily to fulfill individual aspirations devoid of consideration of the common good. Further social disintegration may result from the constant fragmentation in the development of subgroups within missionary Christianity, which invariably affects personal, communal, and institutional identities. There is also the breakdown in traditional social ethics, primarily because of the continual reinterpretation of Christian doctrine mainly because of literalism and lack of 
contextual reference. Indeed, this is not only a situation within Africa, but a worldwide phenomenon among African descendant peoples. It is, encouraged, it is encouraging to see African people on the continent, including individuals within academia and the academic arena, engaging in the retrieval of traditional customs and belief system in order to develop greater social cohesion and foster African identity formation among African uh, people. This retrieval involves a reenactment of African sociology in a way to develop more cohesive and healthier self-understanding. Religious identity takes the form of membership in a social club. Paradoxically, when religion emphasizes group norms over individual choice or values, they also create numerous branches among Christianity so that there is a disruption in the family to the extent that family members belong to different religious groups which many times create alienation in the family. Consequently, sometimes there are four or five religious identifiers within a single household, maybe Episcopalian, Seventh-day Adventist, Methodist, Baptist, uh, just to name a few, so that this militates against collective action even at the unity of the family. Instead of the engagement of family coming together, there is friction and conflicting identity commitment. It is generally the case that religions emphasize group norms over individual choice and function as a system of social control. But constant fractionalization results in the inability to pursue social cohesion and engage in goals that would be beneficial to the community at large. Many times, denomination loyalties, as in the case of Christianity and sectarian impulses in Islam, militates against pursuing common goals at the community level, also uh, national and international. It is of urgent necessity to explore the possibility of retrie retrieving elements of African ethical values that can serve as a unifying principle in the presence of so many competing claims and doctrinal controversies within religions. Uh, religions like Christianity and Islam and other worldviews to which a vast majority of African people adhere. The prolification of these competing claims result in numerous conflicting understanding about ethical values, individual and communal obligations, and commitment to the norms of the social order. Many times the acceptance of these competing belief system of necessity puts severe strain on families, families cohesion from the point of view of interpersonal relationship and socioeconomic development. Many family members see no need for cooperative action in terms of long-term goals, including economic development. One way of countering the mushrooming of sectarianism may be to indirectly foster the civic culture with quasi-religious elements in some countries where there is continuous and accelerating religious fragmentation. This will come of national. On the other hand, one of the reasons for putting together this kind of intellectual enterprise 
is to recognize the presence and the continuous growth of African religions and traditions within the Americas and to provide a forum whereby practitioners can give a philosophical, theological expression of the underlining assumptions and inner workings of these traditions. There is also the need to demonstrate the political and social consequence and our consequences of specific religious orientation. It is the expect it is the expectation that speakers at this conference or gathering will engage in the elucidation of religious practices, philosophical beliefs, and their attendant consequences. We are also seeking to give legitimacy to traditions that have been considered to be unorthodox and devoid of social respectability. Some speakers will demonstrate that these marginalized worldviews have their own internal consistency, philosophical, theological, and systematic development rooted in the daily struggles of people who adhere to these beliefs. These belief systems have gone through centuries of development and reformulation and have reached their current systematic development through actual practice, through engagement in day-to-day -day activities of farming, building, festival, communal gatherings, daily struggles with life and death, and conflict resolutions. Doctrinal practices are windows through which social realities of religious organization can be observed and analyzed. The doctrine of personal salvation inevitably result in seeing oneself as separate from others and generally leads one to seek redemption in isolation from others. The preoccupation with another sphere another world of perfection and goodness, and the designation of the present order as evil, sinful, quite frequently lead to disengagement and quietism or the maintenance of the uh, status quo. This duality with doctrinal teachings within Islam, Judaism, Christianity, to name a few religions, separate man from nature, man from God, militates against the possibility of a cosmic understanding of ourselves in the world. The main stumbling block in the duality between nature and spirit, man and God, and the hope of a new dispensation where goodness will prevail. The, the doctrinal teachings have practical consequences. One may see the, na the natural order as corrupt, as tainted. The natural order is merely a temporary abode for which one must work toward the perfection of something better. Doctrinal teachings have economic consequences. Since this is merely temporary abode, the natural order can be exploited knowing that in the end it will be transformed and regenerated. This belief sets up a duality between the human person and nature and limits the awareness of our interconnectedness. If we want to understand this, in this interconnectedness, then we are, are easily instructed by the natural order. In the animal kingdom of which we are a part, there are certain levels of our DNA which can be found in many life forms, whether in the chimpanzee, in the fish, the earthworm, or plant life. In the end, one of the main purpose of this conference is to explore the possibility of our interconnectedness and the understanding of different cultural, historical, social designations of what 
may be called the religious. The scientific understanding of our interconnectedness can allow us to exercise greater openness as we examine cultural phenomena related to religious expression, even as we maintain a critical posture about our subject matter. Many times, there are underlining assumptions that might not be obvious in the religious outward expression. An examination of the latent structure of beliefs can reveal certain anxieties that are being experienced in the culture and various ways in which people try to cope by forging new identities and new beginnings. Nowhere is this more evident than in America's civil religions as expressed in various national sports. People align themselves with different teams and engage in various rituals as a way to encourage group identity. Religion is grounded in identity formation. That is why 11 o'clock on Sunday is considered the most segregated hour as evident in the most dominant religion, Christianity, in the United States. In many religious institutions, ethnic identity is the most pervasive ingredient in religious practice, and people live out their cultural affirmation through religious practices. These cultural affirmations inform doctrines which might be similar in their codification from denomination to denomination. On the other hand, in civil religion, a wider sense of national identity is affirmed. In the nation, where people live vicariously through their sports, heroes, and heroines. Civil religion, therefore, is this umbrella cultural practice that cuts across ethnic and racial lines and can be more inclusive than institutional identities derived from religious organization. Another fruitful area of investigation, which at time in this conference might be referred to a reference, is the whole idea of socioeconomic status within uh, Christian denomina denominational affiliations. Consequently, it might be worth the while to observe how doctrinal understanding or practices relate to economic pursuit and economic status. And during this conference, we will also be instructed as to how oppression and displacement result in new religious movement and their impact and in, the, in the Western Hemisphere. These movements, for the most part, exhibit high levels of internal consistency, systematic development, at the same time engaging in practices applicable in daily lives. We hope to demonstrate commonalities within different worldviews while bringing into the conversation worldviews that have been marginalized and, in some instances, demonized. In the spirit of academic exploration, I hope that we may be able to foster a dialogue on the unity of knowledge and the interconnectedness of peoples and culture on our planet, which at this time and at this very moment is undergoing tremendous stress and travail. Welcome again to everyone, friends and colleagues and others. And uh, at this moment, it's going to be my great pleasure uh, to welcome to the floor here <coughs> from Mary Taylor, I guess she's here, who 
She has been working assiduously to make this event possible, and without her, we would not be able to be at this place today. So, very, very hearty welcome to you, Mary. And she is from the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics at the Graduate Center. And I welcome you with great enthusiasm. Everett's a hard act to follow, and I will just say a few words. I'm really just here to welcome you on the behalf of the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics. I'm the assistant director there. That's a small center here at the Graduate Center, um, founded by political geographers, so its title may suggest that. Um, we're very, very pleased to host this conference here, and um, I don't really want to do any advertising, but I will tell you where you can find the center online if you'd like to see other events that we put on. You can find it at pcp.gc.cuny.edu. You can also just search for the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics, and you'll find it. And uh, there's one upcoming conference which um, overlaps thematically a bit with this conference that I'd like to let you know about. It'll be on November 20th. And twenty-first, and it's entitled the and 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 a set of discussions around the work of Cedric Robinson's unfortunately little-known book, Black Marxism and the Making of a Black Radical Tradition. Uh, so I'd love to see you all back here if you're in the, the tri-state area and can make the trip. I think uh, it'll be a great way to continue this conversation. Uh, so again, welcome on the behalf of the center and thanks to Everett for bringing such an interesting and exciting conference to us. Welcome everyone. We'll ask the members of the uh, first um, pre uh, presenter to come forward at this time. Good morning. We're a small group, but uh, like a drop in the water, we can create large ripples. So um, please greet the person next to you. If you're not sitting next to somebody, maybe move. We can be closer, become more intimate. <laughs> So, my name is Sarah Mokuria, and it's an honor to be here with you all this morning. Uh, I'm looking forward to what is always an um, intellectually stimulating experience. Anything that Dr. Green um, is involved with always leaves me with many questions and um, lets me know how much more work I have to do as a, as a human being in terms of keeping my mind sharp and moving. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Daniel McLean, who is, David, I'm sorry, uh, David McLean, who is a lecturer at uh, philosophy and business, uh, business ethics at Rutgers and Malloy College. He's also a member of the Board of Governors at the New School for Social Research. And we are going to start this morning off on a very important conversation that uh, generally comes up at some point in your life, a lot of times when uh, we're faced with death, the idea of what happens next, right? What is this thing of life about and, and what happens afterwards? So um, thank you, David, for leading us in a conversation around salvation and, and different philosophical pinnings on it. So 
So good morning. Just turn my recorder on. Everett um, was very generous with the amount of time he gave me, so I, I'll use it. Um, but I'll start first with sort of an uh, ad-libbing a bit before I read the paper to jump off of some of the things that Everett said about uh, the demonization of other traditions, um, uh, the description of my bio that I gave to be read here is pretty sparse. I'm also an ordained uh, minister. I went to an interfaith seminary, and part of my education was to study different traditions, one of which was Ifa. Um, didn't get into it in any depth, but one of the best presentations I've ever seen was by a Babalao. If you know Yoruba religion, you know with, uh, the Babalao was sort of a priest in Ifa. And he came uh, bedecked in kente cloth from head to toe. I wasn't quite sure, and neither were the other seminarians, what we were going to get uh, in the presentation. Uh, it turned out that he was uh, not only a, an Ifa a Babalao, but he was a marine biologist. He was Trinidadian born. Um, and he began his presentation by first describing uh, Ifa to us, what the uh, Babalao does in the tradition, uh, and the various names and things that attend y Yoruba religion and Ifa. As a marine biologist, he was actually part of a NOVA um, episode. NOVA is that scientific show that's run on PBS. And he actually brought the tape with him of the episode, but this was the full episode. The one that ran on PBS uh, was edited, uh, and what he wanted to talk about with us was actually cut. He was on a uh, expedition to uh, retrieve uh, and he was on this huge scientific exploratory ship, uh, worms uh, that exist near geological vents in the deep sea floor. He was tr troubled by the fact that the ship was going to be just retrieving these worms without paying any homage to the earth or to the sea. Now, you can imagine that on the ship, the mentality was not amenable to paying homage to the gods of the sea. <laughs> uh, he convinced, I'll, I'll speed this up a bit, but he convinced the crew that in order for them to retrieve these worms, and they're about six, seven feet tall, you know, they feed off of the, the heat and the, uh, the, mic the microbes that live around these geological vents in the deep sea. And, they, and I think at the time, no, none of them had ever been retrieved. Not one had ever been retrieved before. So he was worried that just retrieving these creatures without asking permission first would sort of be sacrilege. He convinced the crew to do it. And in the Ifa tradition, as I, if I recall it, everyone had to pay some kind of a, give some kind of a sacrifice to the sea in order to ask for permission to retrieve these worms. He actually got the crew to go along with it. So alongside the ship, all along the gunwale of the ship, are all the scientists, and they're saying, well, what, what do you want us? And they, you know, they're smirking, because this is way outside their religious comfort zones, or their comfort zones, period. There's, who knows how, if any, any of these people were religious at all. So he says, you can give them anything. It's just, it's just a gesture. So, he had people give M&Ms. He put M&Ms in a cup and nuts. And um, he uh, essentially led a liturgy uh, and a ritual where each, each one of the crew members had to go and deposit their, their offering into the sea. And the interesting thing about that was um, that people were moved by it. For the first time, some of these hard-headed scientific types actually said, it was actually moving. We started out with a smirk and wondering what in the hell we're doing here. But by the time we finished, we actually felt good about having done what we did. Uh, so just to Everett's point about demonization of other traditions, uh, you know, demonization of anything that comes out of Africa, uh, even viruses have a special demonization associated with them. And for the record, since this is being recorded, I guess, uh, Yesterday we discovered that uh, we have the first case of Ebola in, the, in New York City. 
Um, but there's a whole racialization and African demonization about a particular disease, which I think is part of the narrative of what's going on now. Anyway, so I just wanted to, to let Everett know that I think that I heard his remarks about that and wanted to give my own little story about it. All right, so my paper is a bit off point in some respects because um, uh, I want to talk about salvation, which is one of those scary words to people that are in, have an interfaith sensibility because of the strong Christian connotations of the word, but you'll see where I'm going to go with this. I, the, the title of the paper in your program is called Four Types of Soteriology, actually discovered a fifth type, so the paper is now titled Five Types of Soteriology, um, and I'll explain why, why I made that move since I gave Everett my abstract. So let me just begin by reading. Um, defining religion uh, can be tricky, just as defining philosophy and art can be tricky. Because of this, some take the attack of Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart in Jacobellus versus Ohio, 1964. Jacobellus was concerned with, among other things, the question of what is or is not obscenity. Justice Stewart, in a quandary over how to define obscenity with some, of, with some aid from one of his perhaps equally worldly law clerks, Alan Novak, determined that as regards obscenity, quote, I know it when I see it. Stewart wrote in his concurring opinion, I shall not today attempt further to define the kinds of material I understand to be embraced within that shorthand description. And perhaps I could never succeed in intelligibly doing so, but I know it when I see it. And the motion picture involved in this case is not that, is not obscene. If this was a dodge, it wasn't due to intellectual laziness on the part of Stuart, but rather it was due to the traps and tangles that certain words and their use set for us. Religion appears to be another one of those words. And for those with no sympathy for what they take to be religion, and especially those who abjure it altogether, that it shares with obscenity a similar definitional difficulty might seem deliciously fitting. Be that as it may, the point is that certain things, even things that are ubiquitous and with long histories, long historical tales, and perhaps because of their ubiquity and historical tales, can be hard to lock into fixed and tenable definitional borders. In some liberal religious traditions, attempts to define religion extremely broadly have resulted in incoherence and muddle. Certain religious conservatives self-identified as such, on the other hand, offer definitions that leave out forms of practice, as Everett was referencing before, that leave out forms of practice, thought, and attitudes that, may, that many believe should be included under the heading religion. At the same time, to utter Greek Orthodox or Greek Orthodox Church or Islam or Ifa is to utter words that most take to refer unproblematically to specific religions with very little doubt about the matter. To trot out a now hackneyed but still useful notion, they share family resemblances in that one, uh, in that one notes in all three a belief in realities outside of the realm of which may reasonably be called ordinary experience, God, a moral order beyond time and chance, and beyond human peccadilloes and errant judgments, a pervasive divine reason, and such. There are associated with these monikers interpreters of the faith, those who perform ritual and liturgical roles, priests, imams, babalaos, rabbis. It would seem odd for someone to suggest that Ifa or Islam is not a religion, less so when one considers Unitarian Universalism or ethical culture, which to different uh, degrees have much less truck with or use for notions such as God or metaphysical moral order or a pervasive divine reason, such as captured by the notion of logos first employed by Heraclitus in a special metaphysical sense and carried forward into Christian theology and beyond. Yet both Unitarianism and ethical culture push back and claim that they are indeed religions and for more than the tax exemption, I would imagine, Although the features just referenced, the features that come to mind when considering 
Greek Orthodoxy or Ifa, are not prominent or are missing altogether in those traditions. Certain religious progressives who like to define religion broadly often take refuge from the incongruities between more clear and less controversial candidates for the moniker religion by looking into the etymology of the word. We are a religion, they say, because what religion connotes is the binding together of people in a community of meaning. But such resorts to etymology can simply make matters worse. Religion scholar uh, Kevin Shilbrack, in the July 2013 edition of the Journal of Religion, in an article titled, What Isn't Religion, begins the article, this article is motivated by the sense that the category of religion has become sprawling, overly inclusive, and unwieldy. He goes on to argue that the functional definitions of religion rooted in etymology, including those iterations that are proffered by many progressive, religious progressives, threaten to render the word religion meaningless, other than for special purposes for certain scholars. Religion, from a functionalist point of view, casts a net so wide as to include at least arguably bridge clubs, carpenters' unions, and symphony orchestras. Something has gone wrong here, and some might argue, some might argue the attenuation of language in order to maintain a sort of detente and untenable inclusiveness has, in some cases, run amok. The problem seems to be represented by the old saw, if everything is X, then nothing is, as applied to this or that thing that X might represent. Yet, who is one to deny a group the right to call itself a religion? even if the family resemblance between the group and those other traditional forms, Greek Orthodoxy, Islam, and Ifa, for example, is like the family resemblance between an aspen forest and an aquatic forest of kelp. It is precisely that we are tempted to use scare quotes around the word forest when we refer to an agglomeration of kelp that contains some clues as to the nature of the dubitability. In common and pervasive usage, the word forest calls to mind trees growing out of the soil, on land, which provides the backdrops of humanity's many narratives of lived experience, narratives of war, of danger, of forbidden love, of taboos, of nature's simpliciter in a synecdical sense, and of metaphors and mythos concerning human confusion, danger, and heroic challenge, as so often seen in the archetypical story of the hero's journey. There is the famous 1982 walk in the woods near Lake Geneva, where Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev outlined a framework for a nuclear arms treaty. We have the journey of Siddhartha Gautama, largely undertaken with fellow mendicant seekers in the forests of what is now Nepal. And it was under a tree, not a stalk of kelp, that he achieved his goal of awakening. In children's fables, we have Hansel and Gretel, whose fate is decided in the woods, where both evil lives and ingenuity and cunning are tested. And we have Little Red Riding Hood, making her way through the woods to her grandmother's house, stalked by the evil and deceptive wolf. And we have the connotation of a woods uh, as places of contemplation and renewal. Thoreau's little cabin at Walden, the footprint of which I recently visited, was in the woods of Concord. And we have, and we even have the serendipitous name Bretton Woods as a place where statesmen met to work out a better field of play for commercial and financial exchange. The strands of kelp waving with the currents and tides in their aquatic homes trigger no such images for us, no feelings that are similar to those, no thoughts, hopes, dreams, or horrors. Yet the stalk of kelp is not entirely unlike the tree. And as it grows together with other stalks, it is not entirely unlike the common forest of trees with which we are so familiar. Kelp has a case to make concerning its likeness to the aspens, which, given their own unique pattern of growth, the aspens, that is, are very unlike the typical non-Aspen forests, for Aspens grow in colonies from a single root system. 
like beads on an, on, an, on an underground necklace to give us the largest single organism in the world. We look at the aspen and see only trees, but how unlike their cousins they are, yet like their cousins nestled together over other acres, they have a similar evocative power. While functional def definitions of religion seem to pose problems, we may yet find some common thread that is less problematic than the notions that religions must be about God or heaven or merely community. I wish to suggest uh, that what religion does is primarily through, uh, certainly, although certainly not exclusively, soteriological in nature. As far as how I understand the nature of religion, I will say that by religion, I mean those communal and shared collections of ideas and actions, including a wide array of rituals and practices that are intended to elicit what Mircea Eliade referred to as, uh, as, as hierophantic experiences, as well as, but not limited to, a heightened sense of one's connection to the world as both totality, the world as such, the universe, even the multiverse, and plurality, the world in all of its various forms, formations, and becomings, and one's place in it. And by saying that religion seems to be primarily soteriological in nature, that is to say it's about salvation, I'm suggesting that its sine qua non is that it saves. Without its soteriological, soteriological dimension, what remains are exigencies of a more or less quotidian nature, means, ends, adjustments in response to the needs of somatic bodily life, for food, for position in instrumental communities, for habiliment, etc. The notion of salvation calls to mind the Christian context in which emphasis is placed upon a specific notion of rescue from, for example, sin or death and or those who worship false gods. But if one gives due respect to the various communal forms, the members of bodies of which they prefer to call, uh, call religion, salvation would not be saddled with this limited conception, even within the Christian tradition broadly construed. It seems arguably central to any notion of religiosity from Ifa, at least arguably, and to at least arguably ethical culture. Given that, I will sketch at least five conceptions of salvation and will argue why it is the case that salvation is critical to understanding the purposes served by and through religious commitments and activities. These five conceptions I shall call and I, I regret that I basically decided to dip into jargon. Maybe I'll clean this up when I, if I publish this piece. The monosalvific, mono mean, meaning one, of course. The teleosalvific, with respect to a goal-oriented notion of salvation. The mystico-salvific, the quotidio-salvific, and the aesthetico-salvific. I will contrast these five with the language and narratives of social hope and social justice that many today hold as the singular focus of our moral and existential imaginations. Let me say a word first about why I emphasize soteriology as I do. In my view, to be religious is to construe and embrace the human experience as concerning not just intellectually but with powerful affect, emotion, far more than any single insight, thought, or emotion can capture. After a survey of many different traditions, it seems that the religious sense begins with, or at least should develop toward, if one is a devotee or adherent or disciple, stupefaction. The stupefaction of being human. That is to say, the awareness of our humanity and our place in the world stuns us, renders one speechless, induces responses that range from euphoria to nausea and dread, but only when, through a feat of existential imagination, one feels the compulsion to grasp the whole of things, or, one, or when one feels that what cannot be grasped uh, flood over one, or when one feels plugged into it in a profound perception-altering, even life-altering way. Philosophers, historians, and psychologists of religion see nausea and dread as, as much a part of religious experience as the euphoria of the, of the altar call 
or a deep connection with the dead ancestors as in Yoruba religion. As Antoine Roquentin says in Sartre's novel La Nausée, the world of explanations and reasons is not the world of experience, of existence, I'm sorry. I'll read that again. The world of explanations and reasons is not the world of existence. When existence hits you, explanation and reasons are of little aid. Yet the compulsion follows to speak and to recite anyway. The stupefaction need not lead one to the doorstep of a priest or rabbi or babalao. In the case of Antoine Roquentin in the novel, in La Nausée, it drove him instead to waves of sickness and existential de despair. The response is a response to such despair and nausea. And it is a response that seeks to ward off despair. For Roquentin, as he put it, as regards his existential bouts of nausea, quote, I know it will be back again. It is my normal state. At the end of the novel, however, we find that Roquentin has a soteriological moment of his own. That is, he sees in a brief and startling moment that might be called a moment of grace, a way out of the nausea that he thinks will always be his normal state. I will return to Roquentin's soteriological moment shortly. First, my typology is a salvation as promised provisional though they may be. I'll start with what I have called monosalvific mono soteriology. Such forms are in the traditional religious theologies and dogmas with which we are familiar and ever touched on them, some of them. While the word monotheism seems to be what I'm trying, uh, I'm tying to monosalvific, the fact is that by mono I mean only a schema of religiosity more or less locked in on itself, monistic, admitting a few alterations to his insights. It is the way. It does some good work. It provides an answer or a set of answers to the question of existence. It ends the suffering. Its adherents remain for a variety of reasons, but at root they remain, I believe, because within it, the question of existence, the stupefaction, is taken to be a serious variable and exigent fact and not brushed to the periphery. What surrounds it may be teachings and practices that may be eminently rejectable on empirical or logical grounds, but because the engagement with existence is real, because there is the repetition of reminder that he or she is not merely the sum of his or her parts, as the adherence feels intuitively, is a deep truth, is the foundation upon which the adherence to the religion is built. The adherence uh, stays for the saving messages woven through the problematic catechism, midrash, hadith, through the various dogmas that run counter to sense, or even when the community lapses into great moral error, as we have seen with the Catholic pedophilia scandals. So that's just a brief sketch of what I mean by monosalvific soteriology. Now on to teleosalvific soteriology. By this I mean forms that are mystical in nature, that provide an unmediated and intuitive sense of the world, the world's goodness, for lack of a better word, despite suffering or what the Buddhists call dukkha, despite death itself. The world is on its way somewhere, and each of us is along for the ride, and the ride is glorious. Ralph Waldo Emerson, in his essay, Circles, refers to the flying perfect quote unquote, which is intended to relay the sense of a cosmos heading somewhere, never static, but one in which we are very much apart. One finds a sense of salvation in the deep acceptance of the process itself. The sense of absurdity, of nihilism, of nausea, of dread, ends with a radical acceptance of the process, heading off in various directions, going places, and going through transitions of forms too wondrous for us to get our heads around. The process becomes trusted, not resisted. One can say of the teleosalvific that one is saved by hitching oneself to the direction, quote unquote, that the universe will take one. 
This means ceasing one's worries about transformation, change, time, and death, but rather is a radical acceptance of all of them. A new story of the self is spun out of this form of soteriology. Examples of the mystical salvific is to be, are to be seen in the examples of the Sufi mystic Mansur al-Halaj, as well as in Jalaluddin Rumi, who followed the wonderful and liberating words of Shams of Tabriz, whose disappearance led Rumi to burst out with verse, or burst into verse, to recite about what one cannot speak about. It is the sense of oneness with the cosmos which forces an emptying of the ego, the ego so prone to wounding and pain, and that it sees itself as separate from its source. The reed cut from its bed symbolizes, and symbolized for Rumi in a big way, the mystical overcoming of separation. The reed was a key symbol for Rumi. The reed, when, when taking the form of the flute, is said to be in the tones that emit from it, in complaint about its separation. Here is a selection from Rumi's uh, Dar al-Masvani, Rumi's spiritual poetic uh, couplets. Listen to the reed, the flute, how it is complaining. It is telling us about separations. It is saying, ever since I was severed from the reed field, men and women have lamented in the presence of my shrill cries. But I want a heart which is torn, torn from separation, so that I may explain the pain of yearning, the yearning for reconnection. The mystical salvific shares elements with the teleosalvific, and all of these share elements with one another, by the way. But it is not concerned with the process, the wither of the universe, of the cosmos, just the is. Salvation comes with opening it oneself radically to the isness under which process itself may be construed. What you seek is seeking you, says Rumi. Be still. There is no place to go. You are already there. Such is similar to Buddhist teachings, as well as Taoist and certain Native American spiritual teachings. Next in my provisional typology, there is the quotidio salvific, soteriology. It is not necessarily metaphysical or theologically rooted or oriented. The great naturalists that we've all studied, John Muir, Freeman Tilden, uh, John James Audubon, Florence Merriam, Henry Thoreau, and Emerson again, and many more known and unknown figures fix or fix their gaze on the natural world and never seem to turn away from it. One could say they were transfixed intoxicated with the interconnections, the beauty, the cyclicality, and so reliability, the vastness and unity of the earth, too intoxicated to be concerned with what may be beyond it. Many today find deliverance through the fixed gaze on the beauty and sublimity of nature alone, whether alone or in the associations of like-minded lovers of nature. In, in which humanity is forever embedded and so expanded beyond such embeddedness, connected to all things, living or, in, or inanimate, as near as the stream or as distant as a quasar. Finally, I come to the late addition to my typology, triggered from my consideration of Antoine Roquentin. Sartre, through Roquentin, seemed to tell us that despite the terrible existential sickness that Roquentin suffered and would always suffer, that there was a way out. It was through serious aesthetic engagement, the dimension poo-pooed by Kierkegaard as merely a preliminary step on the stages of life's way, but perhaps the only form of deliverance available to Roquentin, given who he was and where he was at the time. Of course, Roquentin's aesthetic life would be in the future, the contemplation of such a life as a novelist, at the end of the novel, seemed to be the solution to that nausea that he thought would always be with him. Of the negress who sings and the Jew who composed the tune that Roquentin continues to recite at the novel's end, Roquentin says this, she, the negress, sings, so two of them, so two of them are saved, 
the Jew who composed the tune, and the Negress. Saved. Saved. Maybe they thought they were lost irrevocably, drowned in existence. Yet no one could think of me as I think of them with such gentleness. No one, not even his former lover, Annie. They are a little like dead people for me, a little like the heroes of a novel. They have washed themselves of the sin of existing. Not completely, of course, but as much as any man can. This idea suddenly knocks me over because I was not even hoping for that, for that sort of thing anymore. I feel something brush against me lightly and I dare not move because I'm afraid it will go away. Something I didn't know anymore, a sort of joy. Couldn't I try, Roquentin wonders, couldn't I try? Naturally, it wouldn't be a question of a tune, but couldn't I, in another medium, it would have to be a book. I don't know how to do anything else. But not a history book. History talks about what has existed, and existent can never justify the existence of another existent. My era, I wanted to resuscitate the Marquis de Rolaban, a minor historical figure that Roquentin aimed to write about. Another type of book, then. I don't quite know which kind, but you would have to guess behind the printed words, behind the pages of something which would not exist, which would be above existence. A story, for example, something that could never happen, an adventure. It would have to be beautiful and hard as steel and make people ashamed of their existence. I must leave, I am vacillating, I dare not make a decision. If I were, if I were sure I had talent, but I have never, never written anything of that sort. Historical articles, yes, lots of them, a book, a novel, and there would be people who would read that book and say, Antoine Roquentin wrote this, a redheaded man who hung around cafes, and they would think about my life as I think about the Negresses as something precious and almost legendary. A book, naturally, at first, it would only be a troublesome, tiring work, it wouldn't stop me from existing or feeling that I exist. But a time would come when the book would be written, when it would be behind me, and I think that a little of its clarity might fall over my past. And then perhaps, because of it, I could remember my life without repugnance. Perhaps one day, thinking precisely of this hour, of this gloomy hour in which I wait, stooping, for it to be time to get on the train, perhaps I shall feel my heart beat faster and say to myself, that was the day, that was the hour when it all started. If salvation is the sine qua non of religion, salvation from the pangs of existential dread and forlornness and despair, from the paralyzing sense of absurdity, taking various forms of expression that spill over from one to the other, there are certainly elements of Buddhism in Jewish mysticism, of Taoist passivity or Wu Wei in Islam, then we must conclude in the case of Roquentin that the theme of salvation also spills over into the non-religious, whether in the form of the Aspens or the form of the Kelp. If that is so, then what is opened up are ways to set aside hackneyed, dualistic notions of secular versus religious, sacred and profane, and see that the theme of salvation can jump the banks of religions. The need for salvation can be found everywhere, so long as there are imaginations that grasp the human condition in its fullness. Roquentin is in need of deliverance as much as the grandmother in Prods or Peoria, responding to the preacher's altar call, as much as the Buddhist novice in search of respite from dukkha. This view can create deep compassion for the human beings who work out their salvation through structures that seem foreign, impenetrable, and even absurd. The wielding of the intellectual scalpels of critique at religious dogma and problematic propositions though at times extremely necessary, 
is to play at the surface of things only. The engagement with existence, with the absurdity, is what lies beneath. As Roquentin says, the world of explanations and reasons is not the world of existence. If this is so then, should we gather our magnanimity? If this is so then, should we gather our magnanimity? We may see at the heart of religious and serious aesthetic engagement the quest for salvation. This is how I have come to appreciate the world's various religious traditions, as well as the deep non-religious aesthetic engagement, as well as the naturalist fevered immanentism, and have come to appreciate them all, have a deep respect for them all, that is, when they are at least, uh, at the, when they are at their best, I should say. For some years now, I have been aware of something missing in our various progressive approaches to what has been called liberation, something that I uh, gave a paper on in 2005 at another conference. The call for liberation, which focuses only on social hope and social justice themes, leaves out far too much, in my view. It might be useful for scholars concerned about problems of justice and social hope to broaden our understanding of what liberation from oppression and deprivation mean. In my view, what gnaws at the present peace is not only a problem of social distance and disparities of wealth and disparities of income, segregation in our public schools, the worldwide abuse of women and girls, all of which are very real and very exigent, but a crass commercialism and secularism that has marginalized the age-old engagement of the question of existence and what is to be done. The industries that we associate with the commercial are then, ironically, in league with the industriousness of those fixed merely on the social and the political. Salvation entails more than fair treatment, food in the stomach, a decent roof over one's head, those things humans are not alone in requiring. It entails meaningful answers to the question, the riddle that is life itself. Thanks. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, I'd like to open the floor to questions now. So there are microphones at either side of the table, if you'd like to, or either side of the room, if you'd like to ask questions. The floor is open. Yes. I think your talk is, is marvelous. Um, can I say, especially for an ordained minister? Um, and in, in that line of thought, I'm wondering if you have ever been before a congregation, are you able to get them into this frame of mind that would allow them to let go of a much more narrow way of thinking? Well, um, I'm, a, I'm a Unitarian Universalist, so being in front of congregations that are broad-minded is easy. <laughs> but as I mentioned in the paper, uh, sometimes broad can be a problem. Um, uh, so trying to refocus uh, on the need for pluralism as well as to focus on the exigencies of the Roquentin type, you know, predicament that both religious and non-religious people experience. And that was one of the points I wanted to emphasize in the paper. Um, it's not always easy. A lot of religious progressives focus only on ethical, social justice questions, as you probably know. And it, it, it's, a, it's a pervasive problem in the progressive wings of many mainline denominations, <clears throat> as well as in, in um, movements such as Unitarian Universalism. So I've been engaged very, very um, 
eagerly engaged uh, and energetically engaged in trying to get uh, my movement, Unitarian Universalism, to, to remember that uh, these existential questions are very real for people and that focusing simply on, on social justice and ethical issues is not enough. So I, I, I'm always in trouble and uh, it's a very difficult, it's a, it's a difficult path to walk, I must say. Yeah. I, would, I would have a hard time obviously going in, into a mainline church uh, talking about Baba Laos. Uh, but, you know, uh, you have to give people a lot of credit. A lot of people are open to lots of things you didn't think they were open to, right? So, yeah. I have a question uh, while you all are thinking. Um, can you speak to the um, how our cultural upbringings and the environment, the lived environment that we're raised in plays into our understanding. For example, people who may not be religious or grounded in a faith but grow up in a very religious country or region still um, operate under the, the um, guise of those faiths or lean into them at, at times of trouble even if they don't um, uh, uh, uphold them outwardly. So, I'll, um, so in in situations where someone is raised in a culture that is very, like Iran, for example, I guess, mm -hmm. right? Something like that would fit your description. Right. Uh, uh, that may abandon the the basic tenets of the faith, uh, find themselves returning to them at certain points in life, I think is a very common phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, for, I know many people who um, uh, are, are just avowed atheists, um, uh, no truck at all with religion, find themselves sitting in a church when they find out about their family member's breast cancer or, or their own issues. They're not, they're not there to participate in the dogma. It's a place that is sacred uh, because the moment calls for sacrality. And, uh, and again, I quoted Mircea Aliada. Uh, the notion of sacred profane is one of Aliada's distinctions between uh, religious sensibilities, uh, religious environments versus profane or secular environments. And I think that there are times in life when, you know, we need the right language and the right setting to, to uh, ex ex properly experience or give voice to what's happening in our lives. So. I'm sure there are many, uh, many uh, lapsed exes, Jews, Catholics, whatever, that find themselves sitting in a synagogue or a church uh, when, when life gets really tough. I think it's just perfectly natural for that to happen. I don't know if that's, does that answer your question? Well, yeah, it does, and I, I guess I was also thinking this, this idea and this concept of salvation and, and wrestling with it outside of a religious context, mm -hmm. right? I think you, you spoke a little bit well, to that's it right. at the that's end. Well, that's right. That's why I brought Requentin into right. it, because, and that's why the, I, I changed the title of the paper to Five Types of Soteriology, because um, there, are, there are people who read such novel, such novel and find that they're unhappy with the ending of the novel, because they think that it was just too easy for Sartre to add Requentin this out, this salvific out through aesthetic engagement. Um, maybe so. Uh, I find it. Um, I, I find it in my own life, my own experience with artists, that there is a kind of salvation in aesthetic engagement. Um, I think many people are looking for some kind of sal salvific dimension to their lives, uh, uh, and I think that um, uh, it is a way. that sacredness outside of the religious experience, right? Well, so I would say that Roquentin did get that, mm -hmm. right? Again, the, he, wasn't, he wasn't going to a religious house of worship. He, was just, he just had a moment, which I call a moment of grace, mm -hmm. using a religious term, where it dawned on him after all of this, this terrible period of nausea and despair that he suffered, that there was a way out. 
and it was through this serious aesthetic engagement. Would it have been sufficient? You know, a lot of the a lot of the uh, uh, the critics of of Sartre's novel, you know, found that you know, look, you know, I don't think that's going to work for Requentin, right? I don't think that writing novels is the way you're going to save yourself from this kind of despair. But you know, I I think people find their salvation wherever they can find it. And and the and what I wanted to do with this paper was to show that there are various ways that people find salvation, that there are various types of salvation, and they, they interweave in one another. There are, it's sort of a yin-yang thing, you know, uh, um, because one is engaged in a monosalvific form of soteriology doesn't mean that there are moments of mysticism or even naturalistic mm -hmm. uh, kinds of uh, moments. Emerson said that uh, one finds Christ not in the church but in the woods, mm -hmm. right? So it's... Uh, I, the, the reason why I wanted to, to lay this out is to sort of break up the kind of dialogue that goes on about religion in the public culture, where people think they can define religion based upon their own experiences, whether you're a Jew or whatever, Unitarian, whatever it is, and say, well, I understand religious experience and I understand what religion is. And I don't think that's right. I don't think you do understand, right? That there are lots of types of approaches to religion. Uh, and what I really want to do is and I use the word magnanimity in my essay, is to say, I you know, personally want to make room for all of the types of voices. Mm -hmm. Because I think there is too much talking at each other, uh, 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 not enough understanding, uh, not enough empathy and sympathy for the human condition, um, and people simply dismissing. Uh, it, it's, we can see specific examples, like what Everett said, you know, the, the demonization of African religious forms, uh, we can see it in the United States with the demonization of Islam, mm. right? Not recognizing that Islam is everything that Christianity and Judaism is in terms of it being full of great people and idiots uh, uh, with deep traditions of mysticism, deep intellectual traditions. Uh, so, I, you know, my job in life, the way I see things right now, is to find bridges so that people can stop talking past one another about these things. But I don't want to give up, uh, and, and I won't settle on the notion that salvation is going to be simply found in uh, attaining somatic, uh, our somatic needs. And so I, uh, you know, so I have a, I do take issue with the notion that, um, you know, when we talk about liberation or justice or, uh, or equality, that when we have addressed the political or social or economic dimensions of people's lives, that we have done those lives proper justice, because mm -hmm. there's a whole different level of, of those lives that are very, very important, right? Have to be addressed. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll take another question. Please. Make sure. <laughs> David, thanks again. I met David at the philosophy, no, public square. David brought me into what I'm doing now. Thank you, and your paper was beautiful. My Thanks. first paper, I'm, a, I'm an alumnus, not of a college, the New York School of Practical Philosophy. Mm -hmm. My very first paper, you brought it back to me just now, was Practical Philosophy as a Codicil to Cognitive Therapy. If you remember, that was mm -hmm. my very first paper. And when you talk about demonizing, last week I was in Buffalo. Someone did a paper on religion in the Bible. She took the Bible, lifted it up, threw it on the ground and stomped on it. That's demonizing. You brought it back to me. That is part of my paper tomorrow at the common school. Sin has many tools, but a lie is the handle that fits them all. I saw the lie. Your paper was beautiful, David. One thing I would ask, uh, the question I wanted to ask, do you think that someone taught me in the, I'm an Ethiopian Orthodox, that religion means R-E, return to the legions. Is that one of the avenues that you're looking to go to. Uh, well, what do you mean by that? The word religion, R-E means return and legion to the legion. Going back to the past, Sankofa, my society, means it is not taboo to go back into the past 
to retrieve what you forgot, lost, stolen, was taken. Are you saying that we should go back to the past? The original, the book I'm reading now, the Africans who wrote the Bible. There's information in that book. It's very, how should the thoughts, the questions that are in there, if that is a fact, should we be going back to where religion started? Well, um, I, you know, I, I really, I'm not quite sure how to answer the question. I think that one, one cannot engage in most traditions without going back to the past in some way because they're, uh, most of these traditions are, are rather old. Um, I, I, um, I do think, though, to be a good Unitarian Universalist, that uh, there's a quote that is used often uh, in our movement that one is not merely the bellhop of history handing the bags of, uh, of, of uh, prior formations forward to the next generation unopened. Uh, so that, uh, you know, where I find people reject the past, okay, maybe I'll answer the question this way, where people reject the past, their traditions that they've come out of as a child or whatever, um, it's because those traditions were handed to them hook, line, and sinker, and they're told to swallow it. And I think that one always has to maintain uh, some kind of critical ability with respect to what one's receiving from, from the past. Uh, I it, think you just it, answered it, it when you said, pass the bags unopened. Oh, un unopened. find a way to open the bags. Right. The issue is opening the bags for inspection. Uh, I agree. What is useful from the past and, you know, I found, you know, as, uh, as, you know I, just to give you, I guess, my own, a piece of my own story, I've, I'll go to uh, the Abbey of Gethsemane for retreats from, uh, from time to time. Uh, one of my heroes is Thomas Merton. Uh, don't always agree with Tom. Uh, sometimes I wonder whether he was the thinker I thought he was, and then I go back and forth on that question. But, but I find in the Catholic tradition a tremendous amount of good stuff. And I, and I find that also the case with the Jewish tradition. There's, so oftentimes people reject these traditions, not really ever having examined them. The total is equal to the sum of all the parts, right? Yeah. Well, so, yeah. thank you so much, Dr. McLean. I think um, for me, I, I take that it is not enough to focus on justice and liberation, that we must also enter the next dimension of human need uh, and, and really open our minds to salvation and, and all the possibilities and ways. So thank you for giving us your musings you. on that. Okay. So please give him a round of applause. Um, okay, one, one tiny question more. Dean, I mm. want to thank you for this very informative talk. You know, I've never thought of um, soteriology in all that those mentions, but I can't help but um, wonder if that the, the, the soteriology, soteriology that you talk about is not that a focus on individual salvation. Oh, I see. Mm. And whereas for Blacks, um, we are seen as a collective. Um, you know, if one black person commits a crime, it's as, you know, feel as if we're all guilty. And so I'm just wondering if, um, in terms of the fact that we are collective, if that so individual um, focus on individual salvation does not sometimes, if it is really um, Okay, dissonant. I see what you're saying. So let me answer it this way. Um, first, by prefacing it that I believe that we're all part of different communities at the same time. We're not just part of one community. Um, there is, a, there is a, a, a theme that runs through um, Christian Jewish ethics, Islamic ethics, um, Buddhism, about the relinquishment of, was well, the Buddhists would say, the ego, right? Taoists would say. And I think that there is another, maybe a sixth 
form of soteriology that I think weaves through all of these others is the, the notion that one only saves oneself, oneself by saving others. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that sounds like a very politically correct thing to say, but when I, when I said that when I did the Love Conference at Malloy College in 2006, and I, be, I don't know, I can't even remember where the idea came from to do that conference. Uh, I think I was watching some things at the Riverside Church uh, on television. Um, um, but I, I think that what dawned on me was that one, that, or even Antoine Roquentin's problem, that one doesn't really save oneself by oneself. Uh, the best way to really live out salvation is to worry about the salvation of other people. So uh, there are a lot of things uh, that, are, uh, that have helped disintegrate uh, Africans in the United States, the African community in the United States. We can, we've talked about that ad nauseum at, at gatherings that you and I have been at. Um, uh, I think all of those things are real. I don't think that, um, uh, I don't think that the problems within the African American community are simply the community's problems, and, uh, nor do I think that they are limited uh, to uh, issues of racism per se. I think some of the things that lead to the disintegration of bonds of community have to do with the same things that are disintegrating those bonds in the public culture in general. Commercialism, right? A very bizarre notion of economics, uh, uh, a a meism in general that I think infects many communities, uh, including the African American community. So in many ways, uh, to to agree with you and and Everett's point earlier in the introduction, uh, I think that uh, African Americans in the United States and diaspora more broadly uh, have suffered kind of a perfect wave, but particularly in the United States, a perfect storm of things that weaken the bonds of community. Some of them are based on uh, the the history of slavery and, and Jim Crow. Some of them are just based upon the nature of this civilization that seems to be hacking at bonds of community every day. And it's that, that is something that I think is suffered by just about every community here. So um, I don't know if that's really responsive, but... And I know uh, myself, I have uh, pl- plenty more questions to ask, um, but just to be mindful of the schedule, we'll continue on. Uh, are, will we take a quick break before the next session, Dr. Green, or, or will we go straight into it? So let's just stand up and stretch and keep our mind going as we give Dr. McLean a hand. So I think we're going to go ahead and start with our next lecture. Good morning, everybody. My name is Eileen Mokuria, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Brittany O'Neill, a doctoral candidate at Michigan State University in African American Studies. She is currently writing her dissertation on the concept of God in the theologies of William R. Jones and James H. Cohn. She also teaches African American and African Studies at Eastern Michigan University. This morning, she's going to present two papers, excuse me, one that she wrote on her own, which is titled William R. Jones and Philosophical Theology, Transgressing and Transforming Conventional Boundaries of Black Liberation Theology. After that, she'll be presenting her and reading a portion of her dissertation's advisor's paper titled Biblical Scripture as 
Historical Text and the African American Experience, a Philosophical Assessment, written by John H. McClendon III. So if you could give a warm welcome to Brittany O'Neill. Thank you, Eileen. I appreciate that warm introduction. Good morning, everyone. The rain finally stopped. I was stuck in the house for two days. I couldn't leave, so I'm glad the sun is finally out. Um, one second. So like Eileen stated, I am a graduate student at Michigan State in African American and African Studies. So my perspective may be a little different because I'm not coming from the traditional discipline of philosophy, but it is something that I'm you know, still interested in. And um, my interest in William R. Jones is grounded in not only his radical philosophy, but also in the fact that I had the chance of meeting him twice before he passed away a few years ago. And during our meetings, we had several exchanges about the nature of black liberation theology and where it fits in in the black um, historical tradition. And that's kind of where my, my interest grew, but um, partly because the black tradition, and specifically black studies, was always on the outskirts of traditional um, mainstream academic units. And black studies, in a sense, transgressed those boundaries as well. And I think um, Jones does the same, the same thing with his idea of a black liberation theology from the perspective of a human, humanocentric theism. So um, without further ado, I will just go ahead and get started since I am reading uh, two papers, so bear with me. The title of my paper, um, and actually was co-authored with um, Dr. McClendon as well, um, is William R. Jones and the Philosophical Theology, Transgressing and Transforming Conventional Boundaries of Black Liberation Theology. So I'm going to begin with a quote from Jones. In the final analysis, then, whether is God a white racist, is a faithful trustee or a fraudulent traitor, hinges upon how one specifies liberation theology's message message and method, its motivation and mentors. The reader now has the vantage point of my interpretation of these critical angles of understanding to judge the case. As I survey the coming dialogue and debate that republishing is got a white racist will spawn between black humanism and black theism, conscientious antagonist on the battlefield in the search for black freedom, I am confident that when future generations review the clash, they will conclude that the adversaries discovered all too late that they were not two distant relatives. In this paper, our prime objective is to demonstrate the legitimacy and validity of Jones's locus within black liberation theology, and additionally to specify how Jones contributes as a philosophical theologian indeed transgressed and accordingly transformed the conventional boundaries of black liberation theology. To speak more in colloquial terms, we contend that Jones was not only a player in the game, but he was also proved to be a major, if not major, game changer. Sorry, so Asada, you already put the use mic some more. Oh, excuse me? Oh, more? Okay, sorry. <laughs> In his pioneering text, Is God a White Racist, Jones radically and decisively surveyed the burgeoning landscape of black liberation theology. With respect to black liberation theology, Jones unabashedly opined, quote, its own practitioners were still unclear about what it entailed for theologi theologizing and even less clear about how to translate its theological theory into concrete strategies for economic, social, and political reconstruction. Jones was met with less than an enthusiastic acceptance. The pervasively lukewarm reception, to put it mildly, was accompanied, that accompanied Is God a White Racist was in large part due to the fact that Jones was not only elected to abstain from Christian-centric theology, but also subjected conventional Christian theology um, categories, methodologies, and doctrines to sharp critique. In Jones', in Jones view, all theological beliefs, values, and attitudes, even those that served as groundwork for black Christian theology, that is to say the theologies within conventional 
black liberation theology, were also open to rational assessment and critical self-inspection. Jones unequivocally affirms, quote, liberation theology's point of departure is a context where oppression is already institutionalized and legitimated. It surfaces primarily as a religious protest against the misuse of religion to establish and maintain oppression. Its method is customized for this purpose. Because its overriding purpose is to exterminate ESP, economic, social, and political oppression, liberation theologians must follow certain God guidelines to avoid working at cross purposes with their goals. In particular, they must identify those beliefs, values, and attitudes that inadvertently nurture oppression and keep it alive." End quote. Jones's approach to black liberation theology is patently unconventional. This is essentially because his starting point for theological inquiry is not predicated on articles of faith as grounds for theological reflection. One of Jones' striking comments was that within the ranks of black liberation theology, there was a certain reluctance and indeed stubborn resistance to engage in, quote, demands of de novo approach to Christian faith and its theological offspring, embracing only those aspects of the tradition whose pro-liberation potential has been clearly certified, end quote. In his article, quote, or in his article, J. Diotis Roberts in Black Consciousness and Theological Perspective gives voice to this conventional approach that is prevailing in black liberation theology. And we think his position graphically and more importantly typifies what are key meta-theological differences with Cohn's conception. Roberts asserts, quote, theology is the study about God and about man's nature and destiny. It includes man's relationship to God and his fellow man. Christian theology treats these concerns in the context of Christian affirmations. Both philosophy and theology are concerned with ultimate questions. Whereas the philosopher may relate these presuppositions broadly to our religious experiences, a theologian must apply his faith claims narrowly to his own theological circle." End quote. So from this Robert's thesis, we are presented with three cardinal tenets that speak to the key meta-theological differences between Jones and his colleagues. The first is the concrete nature of the relationship of God and humanity and how conventional black liberation theology defines the ontological nature of this relationship. Two, the nature of Christian affirmations as the context for doing theology. Therefore, Christian affirmations are assigned special privilege and can stand as undemonstrated. Third, ph philosophical theology is not considered substantial grounds for black liberation theology. The theologian is mandated to hold to some kind of faith claim, allegiance, and obligation. These characteristics of conventional black liberation theology with Jones's philosophical theology renders philosophical methodology as outside the boundaries of theology and thus black liberation theology. Robert here, in effect, removes faith claims from philosophical consideration. The composite impact of this third proposition effectively removes philosophers from theology, as well as, from, as, well as theological claims from the province of philosophical scrutiny. In Robert's estimation, a certain kind of philosophical theology, which is precisely the kind of philosophical theology that Jones brings to the table, has no legitimacy. I find it is authentically, it is not authentically theology. We observe that Jones instead employs philosophical critique via the logical scrutiny of key theological arguments and claims pro-offered, which subsequently are attendant with the basic presumptions and assumptions of conventional, quote, Christian uh, black liberation theology. Jones explicitly states, Quote, a consistent application of antithetical fit and praxis verification does not force one to conclude that the black church, black theology, or Christianity are incompatible with the theology of liberation. 
Rather, what is necessitated is a specific approach and method for theologizing what entails a total and comprehensive examination. Each theological and moral imperative must be regarded provisionally as a carrier of oppression's virus. Each one of our most cherished beliefs, every element of the creed and canon, must be ruthlessly probed and tested according to the praxis verification test question. What supports black liberation? End quote. When theological beliefs, values, and attitudes obtain canonical st uh, st stature, anchored in faith commitments, they are removed from rational assessment. What results is an intellectual milieu in conformity with religious dogmatism. Jones contends that the upshot of this kind of theological conformity based on dogmatic principles ultimately functions to toward the aim of black liberation. Jones is concerned with actively exposing which theological traditions are counterproductive towards liberation. But in order to complete these tasks, philosophical scrutiny of biblical stories and faith claims is necessary. Jones stresses that all beliefs, values, and attitudes are open to scrutiny as a sine qua non towards black liberation. Undoubtedly, his formidable and hypothetical question, is God a white racist? was considered by his colleagues to be at best a misconception of black liberation theology and at worst, the kind of blasphemy that is associated with atheism. Consequently, the very legitimacy of Jones as a black liberation theologian was called into question because he insisted on making theology serve the purpose of black liberation. <clears throat> Jones, Jones ventured to scrutinize how such boundaries were or were not effective means to black liberation. In fact, Jones has redrawn the boundary lines by reformulating and transforming the theological instrument of theodicy, such that its utility and function was no longer in the employment of Christian apologetics. Jones explains, quote, Theodicy is a common term in the field of inquiry that deals with the issue of evil and human suffering. Most often it signifies the attempt to account for human suffering and evil in the framework of one's affirmations about the nature and activity of God. I shall use the term, however, in a different sense. End quote. Instead, Jones articulates how this difference in employment in terms is relevant for black liberation theology. He, he, quote, the centrality of theodicy concludes that the unique character of black suffering forces the question of divine racism. And to pose this question is to initiate the theodicy debate. The black theologian is obligated to reconcile the inordinate amount of black suffering, which is implied in his claim that the black situation is oppressive with his affirmation about the nature of God and God's sovereignty over human history." End quote. Jones's novel idea surrounding the reformation, the reformation, sorry, of theodicy as a critical instrument of black liberation theology was a direct challenge to Christian conventional theology, where theodicy serves as a, quote, prop for oppression. End quote. Jones Pro offers, the aim of theodicy and Christian thought has been to exonerate God's purpose and governance in the face of some questionable and embarrassing features of the human condition. To springboard, um, to springboard for his sem um, seminal text, is God a white racist, was meta-theological in character, namely the problem of discerning what constitutes black liberation theology, which can only be achieved through the process of critical inquiry. In his critique, Jones presumes that any allegiance to black liberation theology mandates that critical um, sorry, that mandates that theological categories, arguments, and claims necessarily must be viable instruments to enhance the process of black liberation. In Jones's view, black liberation is the overriding principle of black liberation theology. Thus, the import of black liberation as the overriding principle means all theological obligations to religious doctrine, 
dogma, and denominational affiliations are subject to critical scrutiny, which is based upon the philosophical principles and current um, concurrent arguments, which anchor the attendance conception of black liberation. From Jones's vantage point, such philosophical principles and arguments are not external impositions on the discourse of black liberation theology. Rather, they are key with the overriding principles of black liberation as the fundamental objective. Herein, we find why internal criticism becomes his modus operandi. Internal criticism is a methodological is a method methodology sorry internal criticism is a methodology that permits Jones to work within the contours of black liberation theology and at the same time review the adequacy of claims that purport to hold up black liberation his method of internal criticism anchors what becomes the threshold issue in norms for theological inquiry the method of internal criticism can be clarified by introducing the concept of the threshold issue or question. There are certain unavoidable questions and issues that confront the philosopher or theologian when he brings his systematic work. This question cannot be evaded because the theological program and the superstructure of his system presupposes an answer to it. Jones states, quote, theology is committed to its discussion on the existence and nature of God, and this entails some implicit or explicit response to the opposing view of atheism or humanism. A theologian who advances his system as Christian cannot evade the issue of Christology. An adequate refutation of the opposing position may be given, or else it must be admitted that a refutation is not possible thus committing oneself to a confessional or assumptive foundation for one system. If this is not done, the remainder of the system is without adequate support. Clearly, it would be built upon a question-begging foundation." End quote. It follows that Jones's theological starting point was philosophical theology rather than biblical theology. With Jones, philosophical theology was a matter of offering philosophical critique to theological claims. Close scrutiny of the logical implications of all claims, Jones thought would take us beyond the presumption of Christian theology, even given a black facade, as a necessary and sufficient condition sans critical scrutiny. In Jones's estimation, the bottom line was essentially a matter of methodology, wherein the method of critical examination rested on philosophical methods of internal criticism that evaluated all theological allegiances. To the extent that other black liberation theologians adopted philosophical theology, we discover that most were inclined to view philosophy as an instrument to illuminate theological claims rather than to critique them. Philosophy at best was a handmaiden to theology. The gap between such notions of philosophical theology along with the preeminence of biblical theology set Jones apart from the broader body of black liberation theologians. The response to Jones was colored by this gap in the theological starting points. We observe all those we observe, although some fellow black theologians offered cryptic comment on Jones's work, for the most part, Jones faced a virtual wall of silence. We contend that this silence was symptomatic of the general consensus that he did not belong within the ranks of black liberation theology. And this is, um, I'm writing my chapter, my third chapter right now, um, on this very subject. And there are several uh, black liberation theologians, um, including James Cone, James Evans, that push um, Jones outside of the boundaries of black liberation theology, saying that his philosophical theology is, is beyond those, the, those needs and it's too abstract that the normal everyday person isn't able to relate to these notions of a a God that's not inter interacting or intervening in our human history. To determine the problematic, 
Oh, I'm sorry. We argue and we will demonstrate that this viewpoint was due to the fact that he transgressed the conventional boundaries that shape most of the customary understanding regarding what constitutes black liberation theology. To determine the problematic, a sketch of how conventional boundaries of black liberation theology are forged with and linked to respective conceptual commitments and theological problems adjoined to black liberation theology um, are necessary. The theological commitment necessary to ma maintain a Christian-centric framework as the core theological enterprise introduces and affix a number of theological problems within the boundaries of conventional black liberation theology with respect to black liberation. Additionally, we will highlight several points where Jones transgresses behind beyond the limitations of conventional black liberation theology to promote an inclusive concept of black liberation theology without committing to a specific theistic domination, albeit still maintaining a religious perspective and a form of theism from the standpoint of humanism. The conventional views of black liberation theology can be examined through four basic points. These four principles include church, creed, and culture. Although I understand that black liberation theology and black theology in general is not a monolithic um, tradition, we felt that these four points could best serve as a, a sketch to outline the conventional standards. Each of these four elements translates into a functional apparatus commonly associated with conventional black liberation theology. At the forefront of the Christian canon, including both black theology and traditional Western theology, is the centrality of the Bible. The use of biblical scripture as a no normative corpus in black liberation theology is best explained through the theology of James Cone. Um, conventional black liberation theologians and their acceptance of the Bible and the doctrine of Jesus' divinity becomes ensnarled in a quagmire of ambiguity and inconsistencies affixed, affixed to biblical theology. Biblical um, scholar Ron Liburd perceptively notes, quote, my basic argument is that black interpreters, African-American scholars and preachers in particular, have invested authority in the Bible as a tool to help reverse, overturn, reject, or ignore every interpretation of the Bible that is designed to oppress and dehumanize them have at the same time left unaddressed the full implications of such use of the Bible. As a result, the black community and other Christians in general harbor the notion that the Bible in its entirety constitutes absolute authority for ethical contact, conduct. It is the word of God. With this presumption, African Americans, I argue, have placed gross restrictions on the ability to forge a truly liberation hermeneutic from our black religious community." End quote. Jones is keenly aware of the epistemological problems associated with biblical assertions about divine attributes commonly associated with Christian monotheism, such as omnibenevolence, and this becomes especially vital in view of the particularity of black oppression. Accordingly, Jones stresses that black theologians must readdress the ambiguity found in faith claims given the actualization of the maldistribution regarding ethnic suffering in the black historical record. For, for example, Jones observes that the historical experience of African Americans does not provide any definitive evidence that God is on the side of the oppressed. At best, we discover that black oppression is multi-evidential evidential, and that the evidence equally, equally suggests the possibility of a demonic deity. This, pos, this principle obviously presents apparently insurmountable difficulties for the black theologian, for it forces him to identify the actual events in which he sees the benevolence and liberating hand of God at work, not for man in general, but for African Americans. So therefore, the story of the Exodus would be excluded because Jones would put that as a liberatory event for Israelites and not for the African-American community. 
This is not easily accomplished in light of the long history of oppression that is presupposed by each black theologian. To maintain accordance with key doctrinal tenets that God will liberate the oppressed and the claim that the Bible is a history book requires the black theologian um, to provide evidence of God's liberating activities in the historical record. By challenging theological claims in biblical hermeneutics, Jones' position within the black theological community has been become reminiscent of a pariah status. As Jones continues to challenge conventional black theology, including the black church, he was further found to be a fraudulent traitor of Christian ideals. To quote Jones, to acknowledge the presence of black religious humanism as a minority tradition in black religion is to affirm that it has been constantly overshadowed by the larger entrenched theism that continues in the black church. Accordingly, to explain the virtual invisibility of black religious humanism, we must focus on several features of institutionalized black theism and decipher their impact. First, we must accent the fact that religious humanism exists as a philosophical theological perspective and not as an ongoing institution like its rival, the black church. To state the obvious, an intellectual movement that lacks the institution base has a limited lifespan, end quote. In the last section of our essay, we address three points of contention respecting Jones's location within black liberation theology. Under dispute is the leading problematic, namely mapping the theological horizons of black liberation theology and hence establishing theological parameters. Where we can de definitively locate Jones in their domain of black liberation theology, the first point under consideration is whether Jones's theological stance is positioned within the historical and cultural context of black religion, tradition, and thought. The first point is theoretically anterior to our leading problematic. It follows that if Jones is not within the historical and cultural context of black religious tradition and thought, he could very well be outside the horizons of black liberation theology. For a number of Christian apologetics in black liberation theology, the broader cultural directed value judgment, which is afforded to religious traditions, correlates that Christian theocentric allegiance is the fundamental indicator for stipulating what is determined as an authentic form of black identity and ethnic membership. The popular saying that African Americans are essentially Christian, slash God-fearing people is an essentialist ascription that has widespread allegiance. Take, for example, the message from the churches from Oakland, which was a statement presented by the National Committee of Black Churchmen. Quote, we black people are religious people. From the, from the earliest time, we have acknowledged a supreme being. With the fullness of our physical bodies and emotion, we have unabashedly worshiped him with shouts of joy, and tears of pain and anguish. We neither believe that God is dead, white, nor a captive to some rationalistic and dogmatic formation of the Christian faith, which relates him to exclusively the canons of the Old and New Testament, and accommodate him to the reigning spirit of a socio-technological age. Jones' rejoinder to this mode of thinking is to accent that, I'm quoting Jones, if the advocate of black religious humanism does not challenge the equation of theism in religion, he or she also provides grounds for the claim that religious humanism is not authentically black. This line of argumentation is unavoidable once the following descriptions of black consciousness are advanced within a semantic framework where religion and theism are synonymous." End quote. Jones constantly fights against the theocentric viewpoint by expli expli explicitly locating forms of humanism both within black religious traditions and black secular cultural expressions. 
Jones argues, quote, in the very limited case where the presence of the non-theistic tradition is acknowledged, it is not labeled religious, nor is it recognized as a legitimate part of the family of black religion. This is not primarily the consequence of its status as a numerical minority in black culture. Rather, humanism itself is suspect as something alien to the black psyche, end quote. And, um, in Is God a White Racist, and additionally in other subsequent publications that Jones put forth, he details different um, modes of religious humanism that has been found in the black um, community, such as um, questioning the existence of God during the period of slavery um, and, and whatnot. Our second point is the problem of the general definition of religion and the concrete defining characteristic of black religious experiences. In Jones' view, we should note that black humanist tradition is a viable and valuable component of black religious tradition, and the academic neglect of its presence is a crucial gap in our historical interpretation. The historical link between black liberation theology and black religious tradition is situated on obtaining an accurate description of the black religious tradition and offering a comprehensive definition of black religion. Additionally, if it is valid and true that humanocentric theism, a form of black humanism, is far from being a foreign admixture to black liberation theology, then in fact what Jones provides us with the alternative of black um, humanocentric theism is a more inclusive principle to the definition of black religion and the description of the black religious experience. Jones's essay, Religious Humanism, Its Problems and Prospects in Black Religion and Culture, he explicitly conveys, quote, one is hard pressed to uncover a pan panoramic analysis of black religion which self-consciously includes the human, humanist perspective as one of the competing options in black religion. Both its opponents and champions can argue that religion, religious humanism has not established itself as an indispensable perspective in black religion. The description of which is required for an accurate and adequate understanding of Afro-American religion. Religious humanism, in some, has little standing as an accredited representative of the black religious experience. Hence, the necessity and purpose of this essay is to inaugurate the discussion that will hopefully establish religious humanism as an authentic expression of black, religious and cult black religion and culture." End quote. Jones discusses the plethora of historical examples of black non-theistic religious thinking. From slavery to postbellum critiques of black theism, Jones concludes that black humanism as a religious entity is an aspect of the historical development of black culture. Quote, to resurrect black religious humanism requires a second interpretive principle that current researchers in black religion do not sufficiently honor. The actual origins as well as the current position of black religious humanism must be seen as a response to perceived, perceived inadequacies of black Christian theism, its theological rival. Implicit in this principle is the, the hypothesis that black humanism emerges as part of a debate that is internal to black life and thought. It is not a spin-off of the Enlightenment, the scientific revolution, or as Diotis Roberts has suggested, borrowing from um, Comte, end quote. In this last statement, we think that Jones's demonstration that the monolithic view that black religious traditions are singularly theistic cannot function as the grounds for declaring that black humanism, and hence Jones, Jones's own theological position, stands out the, outside the concrete historical context of black religion. Black religious humanism is the dialectal counterpart, counterpart to black Christian theism, and together they indeed form what constitutes the broader spectrum of the black religious experience. Our third and final point of discussion centers on Jones's, ontological, Jones's ontology of God and its implications for humanism as an option in black theology and a vital part of the black religious tradition. 
The pivotal concern, concern is the ontological status of God and its meaning for human freedom. In Jones's estimation, black liberation is the overriding principle of black liberation theology, and consequently, it anchors the boundary lines of black liberation theology. Furthermore, as a course of action, black liberation is an exercise in human freedom and not a matter of divine intervention. We inquire into how Jones argues that humanocentric theism affirms the ontological priority of God without the entailment of human ontological dependence on God. One thing is crystal clear for Jones. Such action cannot coincide with human beings in this state of ontological dependence on God. Ontological dependence constricts human freedom to be interpreted as the revelation of God's intervention in the world then human freedom is limited by God's will. Consequently, Jones develops a hy hypothesis about God that on the one hand affirms the reality of God and on the other relinquish, relinquishes God's intervention into human affairs. The ontological priority of God is grounded on God's will and God's will is to grant human freedom to act without God's intervention. Jones argues Quote, humanocentric theism does not assign an exalted status um, command particularly to human freedom, but the status, and here we come to the theistic ground, is the consequence of God's will, and it conforms to his ultimate purpose and plan for humankind. End quote. So in a sense, um, the, the removal of God from interacting in human history is a... Is, is part of God's will. It's not something that Jones did not give an exalted status to humans. He did not give humans the, um, you know, the power of, you know, creating themselves or anything like that. This was all part of um, God's will. We conclude our essay with a quote from Jones, which we think highlights his unique and pioneering role in the process of developing an alternative framework for black liberation theology a framework established on the foundation of the internal criticism, which we think firmly situates him within the ranks of black liberation theology. Jones's critique of his fellow black theologians has at its starting point the very premise, premises on which they brought forth their arguments and claims. Responding to jo James Cone's notion about the freedom of Christian man, whereby Cone argues, quote, each situation has its own problematic circumstances, which force the believer to think through each act of obedience without an absolute ethical guide from Jesus. To look for such a guide is to deny the freedom of Christian man. End quote. And Jones replies, To affirm the freedom of woman and man in the manner is not creeping idolatry. In fact, humanism would affirm that choosing without absolute guides is the given condition of humankind, the inevitable expression of our finitude. Indeed, it is, our, it is necessary to ask if this approach, sanctioned by black humanism, is also endorsed by black theologians themselves. Do they, do they simply read off their theologies from the diaries of their forefathers and forefathers, foremothers, or is their method um, a process of picking and choosing, a selection and rejection, which core units of the Christian and biblical traditions are summarily dismissed because they serve as a maintenance needs of oppression, end quote. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. O'Neill. So before she begins reading um, some portions of her dissertation advisor's paper, I was thinking we could open it up for a couple of questions on um, this specific paper. Very enlightening and stimulating paper. Thank you. I will have about 50, but I'm okay. going to do what I did with Mary Lepkowitz. I, I, wrote, I had 50 rebuttals when I spoke to her at a mic. And I said, if I write a book, you see them in theirs. <laughs> it was too many. But you brought up a lot. But just one, just one or two, very short. You mentioned creation. That's one of my biggest arguments that people forgot. Mm -hmm. I don't hear the word procreation. Zara Jacob 
1696, who wrote a trustee 67 years before Emmanuel Kant was born, 102 years before Dewey was born, and 192 years, rather, before Hegel was born. He wrote a paper called Hatata. Hatata has a one-word meaning, inquiry. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm, I'm going to do. I'm inquiring. You, you didn't mention God gave man free, free will. Mm -hmm. You mentioned creation, but not procreation. Mm -hmm. Because in his paper, he says, I believe in deity, but not in religion because men lie. Mm -hmm. The man wrote that in 1666 in Ethiopia. But I want to like to exchange cards with you because we have a lot of dialogue in the do. Okay. Your point was very good. Thank you. I look forward to talking to you about it. Okay. Well, I will. Um, so, Dr. McClendon is my dissertation advisor, and he was unable to make it uh, a couple weeks ago. He had to miss out on some classes to go to the, I think it was a sala that was uh, in St. Louis or something like that. So, he wasn't able to make it here today. No? He wasn't in the sala because I was there. So, tell him I'll catch him. All right. I'll, <laughs> I'll let him know. Um, but it's a, a paper that he's uh, currently working on, and it's entitled Biblical Scripture as Historical Text and the African-American Experience of Philosophical Assessment. And the paper outlines the um, conception that the Bible is a history book that was put forth by James Cohn. So to begin the paper, I'll start with a quote from Cohn. The Old Testament is a history book. To understand it and the divine revelation to which it testifies, we must think of the Old Testament as the drama of God's mighty acts in history. It tells the story of God's acts of grace and of judgment as he calls the people of Israel into a free, liberated existence. End quote. James H. Cones' notion, the Old Testament is a history book, is replete with a number of philosophically challenging questions. Of course, the most basic problem centers on the question, what is the central meaning attached to the Cohn's definition of what is a history book? Moreover, how can we determine if Cohn's view on the Old Testament is consistent with the manner in which historians conventionally understand the nature of history books? Particularly, particularly as a specific, specified genre of text. Additionally, given its theological overtones, how can we establish with regard to substantive composition if Cohn's position is a substantively grounded historical claim contra its locus as a more basic expression, affixed to his theological claim about God's mighty acts in history? Now that we have established our domain of preliminary concerns, we can now pose the question, how does Cohn's idea of history book into a critical framework imperative notation? In Cohn's idea of the Old Testament as a history book, based, upon, based on a fictive account, I'm sorry, let me reread that. Is Cohn's idea of the Old Testament a history book based on a fictive account of the past, or is it a matter of real historical reporting that is under view? We know that Cohn claims that la the latter. Nonetheless, on closer inspection, we believe this presumption is restricted to only the apparent form and not the sustaining content behind his proposition. Instead of positing that Cohn's claim is a historical delineation, we argue it is more appropriately a theological claim on history. The proposition, the Old Testament is a history book, in point of fact, sustains a theological premise. This is because Cohn's supporting statement is actually a theological claim that presumes God's actions are synonymous with real historical events. What's more, when these events are said to receive historical documentation in the Old Testament, we, however, cannot discern how the Old Testament, given the operative methodological moorings, such as biblical textual criticism and the employment of biblical mythology, is distinctively different from other kinds of fictive accounts of the past. 
Thus, we contend that the theological claim on history is qualitatively different than researching history and arriving at corresponding interpretations based on documented source materials. In fact, we observe Cohn's theological claim on history extends outside the boundaries of the canon of historical research. Subsequently, the evaluation of Cohn's theological claim on history requires criteria suitable for theological claims rather than what is normatively applicable regarding historical claims. Granting that the criteria for historical claims are qualitatively different than what applies to theological claims, we now ask, can the appropriate subject matter for making claims about history comfortably rest on theological presumptions? If we hypothetically assume that Cohn affirmatively answers, we are back to establishing how the criteria for theolo theological claims are relevant to those that are grounded in historical claims. What is most transparent is that Cohn does not seek to make any effort at identifying such criteria, nor does he make any attempt at justifying the relevance of the connection. Why Cohn fails on both accounts is due to the fact that he has no explanation which demonstrates or, ar demonstrates or argues for valid validating his stance. Cohn is content to merely assert that the drama of God's mighty acts in history can be found in the Old Testament. Herein lies why Cohn's claim has little to do with actual history. Essentially, Cohn's claim is more akin to a cursor, which points to his theological presuppositions. In turn, rather than a thesis on how historians should grapple with the past, Cohn's theological assertion is directed at biblical hermeneutics, i.e. his view on how to interpret the Old Testament. Alas, real history is saliently absent as the conclusion, which follows from his theological premise. Therefore, when Cohn offers up his presumption that history amounting to the drama of God's mighty acts in history, our theological accept acceptance of his assumption does not mandate utilization of a historical criteria. Since biblical herm hermeneutics derive from Cohn's theological pre presuppositions, our theological acceptance of this claim only requires that we are in agreement with his theological conception of history and the notion that the Old Testament is a history book. In other words, our theological acceptance need not weigh the historical veracity of his claim. What is axiomatic here is the consensus at the level of theological presumptions does not mandate a critique of result in historical interpretations. For Cohn or any other believer, whether the Old Testament accounting of the Exodus is historically accurate need not enter into question about the theological import. Historical veracity becomes a moot point with respect to the present theological claim. On our considerations of the claim, we discern that it is only superficially history in char character. Although we think Cohn can safely land on ground consistent with the cultural appropriation of the Exodus story, his stronger claim to history is located in a qualitative, qual qualitatively different discourse. Put simply, Cohn's reference to the past events is not based on factual evidence. Instead, these have events concerning God's mighty acts in history are not just explained from the standpoint of Cohn's theological presumptions, but in reality, we realize that they are actually constructed from it. These events are not the product of historical research. Rather, they are theological constructions based on an interpretation of biblical scripture inclusive of method, method, mythological texts. In Cohn's estimation, since biblical hermeneutics effectively suffices as historical interpretation, then we can conclude his thesis about the Old Testament constituting a history books amounts to no more than interpreting biblical scripture. With regard to establishing the demarcation of history and mythology, respecting Cohn's treatment of the Israelites in the Old Testament, we believe rests on the textual locus of the Exodus story. 
Although the Exodus myth lends support to Cohn's theological claim, we discover that as Finkelstein and Silberman point out in the Bible on earth, that the Israelite Exodus, as described in the Old Testament, actually has no supporting evidence from archeological research and historical source documentation. As mythic rendering, it is a fictive account and not a real historical claim. Now, let's hypothetically consider Cohn answering our grounding question on theological presumptions in a contrasting light. If Cohn answers in an astounding no to the question, can the appropriate subject matter for making claims about history comfortably rest on theological presumptions, then of course we, can have a, we will have a different consequence. On this occasion, Cohn could simply elect to publicly declare that he is clinging to theological presuppositions about the past. However, if Cohn pursues this option, then he no longer needs the facade that he is dealing with history in some manner, nor the Old Testament is a history book. History merely becomes a weak pawn, which is played within the confines of supporting theological presuppositions. While the earlier affirmative answer led to evading history, the latter negative response rejects any pretense of a real link between theological presuppositions and historical claims. At this moment, the overriding concern is about theology and its relationship to religious doctrine. It should be clear now that Cohn does not in fact advance the option and instead evades the question of how theological presuppositions are linked to historical claims. With the open admission that all talk about history is primarily for the sake of theological conformity with religious deeds, doctrines, Cohn knows that he can only end up distorting what is at least apparently some mode of interpreting the historical past. Such frank admission thus presents Cohn with a glaring dilemma. On the one hand, Cohn's claim is ostensibly an affirmative of a history project. On the other, the admission brings into bold relief that his theological presuppositions does not entail the empirical verification of historical research. Such an admission exposes Cohn's thesis for what it is, a firmly rooted theological idea that stands in conformity with religious doctrine. Clearly, this dilemma results from the fact that Cohn's thesis cannot stand apart from its chief function of theologically affirming some religious doctrine via biblical hermeneutics. Despite Cohn's lack of admission to openly rejecting history for the sake of theological conformity to religious doctrine, he nevertheless does maintain doctoral allegiance, which are foundational to his thesis. So therefore, the question remains, what are the doctrines that permeate Cohn's interpretation of the Old Testament? On review, the doctrine of an omnipotent and omnibenevolent God are clearly operative in Cohn's treatment of the Old Testament as a history book. Nonetheless, through Cohn, the theologian, is warranted in his belief about God's omnipotence and omnibenevolence. Cohn, the historian, cannot empirically verify if such an entity plays a role in human history. Even if this story may be offered as a mythic rendering of the past with theological legitimacy, it is not the subject matter that historians develop in history books. To claim otherwise is to distort what is the historical approach to the past and what actually constitutes a history book. The historical examination of the Old Testament is in essence a scholarly pursuit. In sum, the academic approach to biblical literature is not founded on theological allegiance or doctrinal obligations. Cohn's theologically grounded and theocentric conceptions of history remain without any semblance to the canons of historical research. What Cohn means by history book cannot be established by resorting to a comparison with what is conventionally affirmed by the discipline of historical research. We submit that the mythic accounts of biblical scripture, when read in the manner consistent with how historical texts are subject to interpretation, normatively normatively understood as empirically verifiable and documented reconstructions of past events, persons, and developments, falls woefully short of the mark. It follows that the idea that scripture has import, then a line of demarcation must be drawn between texts according to their specifications specified genres. 
Namely, we must unearth how we must unearth how mythic texts within biblical scripture, as opposed to historically established documents, offer distinctively different accounts of the past. When the notion that biblical scripture as historical text is presumed without qualification, then this textual distinction about genre remains a neglected problem. Since methodologically speaking, the presentation of history by means of biblical scripture ultimately demands achieving canonical support relating to historical interpretation. Consequently, the manner of drawing this line actually entails engaging in biblical criticism and more precisely historical criticism. On closer examination, we argue that the notion that Old Testament is a history book is not far removed from the pitfalls associated with biblical inerrancy. Biblical inerrancy and Cohn's thesis on the Old Testament each ignore the glaring facts about how scriptural distinctions and the ancient past conflict with historical research and archaeological findings. This is because both the advocates of biblical inerrancy and Cohn fail to employ the historical critical method as a method of biblical criticism. Thus, we observe that Cohn's thesis rests on the ahistorical approach, which extracts biblical text from the historical milieu. Therefore, we conclude that methodologically Cohn's idea of the Old Testament as a history book is more in accord with the premise that guide biblical textual criticism than with the historical critical method. We argue that when biblical criticism rooted in textual criticism, what follows is a greater dependence on theological presuppositions than historical evaluation. Biblical textual criticism's notion that the original texts of biblical scripture offer direct insight into the history of God's ideas and deeds is in an immediate accord with Cohn's theological claim on history. Victor Avalos demonstrates this point when he astutely states, the, quote for, the quest for establishing the reliability of God's words has historically been at the heart of biblical textual criticism. Concern about maintaining a reliable record of God's words can already be detected in the Bible itself. Exodus 34.1 indicates that Yahweh himself is the author of at least some parts of the Bible. If one does not add or subtract to the word a word from the text, then the text remains immutable. Accordingly, Cohn's thesis is foremost a, prop, a proposition about the Old Testament is a historically reliable source, by which its reliability results from the connection to God's words and actions, if not authorship. The assumption concerning the reliability of God's words and deeds in the Old Testament, though couched in historical terms, originated from Cohn's theological commitments. Such considerations hence lead to our chief epistemological query, namely, if the proposition, the Old Testament is a history book, is essentially no more than a theological claim, then what relationship does it have with respect to our knowledge of history? We argue that our knowledge of history is not reducible to theological presumptions. Belief in God's mighty acts as depicted in the Old Testament tells us very little about the truth of an Israelite exodus from Egypt, a Davidic monarchy, or even the facts about the history of the pharaohs in Egypt. In claiming biblical scripture is a history book, Cohn's chief intention is to establish on historical terms why God is on the side of the oppressed. Thus, God is presently intervening in, to liberate African Americans. Cohn's theological claim on history is also a particular view about African American history. As a black liberation theologian, Cohn's corpus is replete with allusions of his theocentric conception of African American history. Since Cohn's theocentric view of African American history is fundamental in expression of his theological position, in this regard, his colleagues can very well disagree with the theocentric conception of history. Given that Cohn's position is a theological claim on history, contending theologies with Cohn's viewpoint are not merely reducible to critiques about his grounding in biblical historical research. Why Cohn's crit critics 
could charitably grant on theological grounds contra historical veracity the legitimacy cones depictions about the ancient Israelites of the Old Testament and Jesus' mission, nevertheless, these depictions could still be deemed as having no relevance to African American history. It is in his Is God a White Racist? A Preamble to Black Theology, William Jones offers this precise criticism of Cohn's theistic view of history. Jones allows for the possibility that the ancient Israelites were beneficiaries of God's intervention. Thus, Cohn claims, we must think of the Old Testament as a drama of God's mighty acts in history. It tells the story of God's acts of grace and of judgment as he calls the people of Israel into a free, liberated existence, stands without challenge. Yet, Jones proceeds to ask, if what way does the divine benevolence relate to concrete African American history? What is the historical indicators that would be true for black liberation? Hence, Jones states, the event of liberation must involve the liberation of the particular group in question. That is, an event of Jewish liberation cannot corroborate the black liberation as part of God's innermost nature, end quote. Although Jones has in his in mind to raise the theological critique of Cohn, the matter of Cohn's theocentric idea of African American history is brought into bold relief. It is our contention that this pitfall, pitfall at root um, emanates from the predicament that Cohn's conflating a theological claim on history with presenting a historical claim. That's that. Thank you so much, Ms. O'Neill. Um, are there any questions um, either from the paper now or previous if you've thought of something? You could just go to the microphones. So with respect to this, so is this on? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, so yeah. with respect to the second paper, uh, I get what the argument is. Um, I just think that it's too strong in terms of the uh, uh, sort of dualistic approach to whether something is a theologically based explication of history versus a sort of biblical critical method approach that, or sort of secular historical, for lack of a better term, approach to to uncovering history, um, because one could uh, one, one one could easily say that, um, uh, for example, looking at empirical. Uh, uh, resting one's position on empirical uh, evidence uh, isn't always the best way to, to uncover history. For example, just recently, just a few years ago, there was no evidence that King David lived at all. No archaeological evidence whatsoever is all written evidence. Now there's archaeological evidence. So uh, uh, Old Testament biblical scholarship uh, has often uncovered things that were Deemed, uh, deemed to be false in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures, uh, or or supported, right? So I don't I don't know that um, such a strong notion that uh, Joan, that Cohen's view was um, simply off in terms of saying that the Old Testament is a historical book really makes that. I don't think he needs that to make his argument. Uh, I think that one could simply say, yeah, the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures is a is a historical text or a collection of historical texts, uh, some of which contain very errant, you know, <laughs> historical information uh, that that modern scholarship has has you know found a way to undermine. Um, the the other question there is, uh, you know, this notion that the Old Testament is a distinct book seems to you know ring in the criticism as well. And I think one has to be careful with that kind of a statement as well. Um, then as to your uh, paper, I was just um, wondering if you might find it useful to look at, um, uh, in relation to Jones, uh, Vadimo's work. Uh, have you looked at that? I briefly. Yeah. So because Gianni Vadimo, basically one of his, I guess, more, well, to me famous uh, comments was that uh, the Christianity is best expressed in secularism. Uh, and what he meant by that was essentially what Jones was saying, that it's, it is the sort of theological notion, if you will, that we are free 
that is the, the best expression of divine love because we're now free to, to act out. Now, Invadimo is very unorthodox, as, you know, as Jones was, but um, I think you might find that interesting. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. First, I got to apologize. I think I have a picture of me and Ogletree at the outside of the conference in my phone. I'll show it to you later. Uh, both Cohen and Jones failed my litmus test. Unless, whenever anyone is doing any papers about history with the religion, and you don't go back to page 757 of volume two of Ancient Egypt, Light of the World, where they show four pictures still to the day carved in the walls in Luxor. The first picture showing a woman with the hieroglyphics that we can now read because at one time hieroglyphics were from out of the world. With the woman being told you will bear a child without a husband. The second picture shows her pregnant with the angel standing in front of her. The third picture shows her sitting on the midwife seat with a nurse holding the baby. And the fourth picture had me up from five o'clock at night when I first saw it to seven the next morning in my office talking to someone about that picture. Three men kneeling with gifts in one hand and onks, which is life, in the other. 17 centuries BC. And on page 812, in the same book, where Horace, mythologically, not history, goes into a mental hell and frees the manes, which are souls, and takes them to his father in heaven, Anyone who's going to write any more papers on, if they don't touch that, they fail my litmus test. It's a failure. Because if you're going to speak on it, like I said before, go back. Sankofa. It's not taboo to go back in the past. It's not. But you pick beautiful papers. I think she has one in the annex. Good, after, good morning, I believe it's still morning. Good morning. <laughs> um, thank you for the paper. Um, <laughs> if I didn't trust you as a scholar and your colleague, I would have said um, there was some plagiarism in there. The reason why, um, we, have, we have had Haitian scholars back in the 1800s and early 1900s who have written a subject. And uh, as you were uh, reading, I quickly went in, into my collection of books just to make sure that my statements will be true. Um, the gentleman mentioned earlier um, some writers of the 1600s, but I can't find the passage, uh, the, I can't find the the. the the line, so therefore I will not quote it. However, as black uh, Americans or black diaspora, we can claim the Bible because Moses, I'm sorry, Moses went to Egypt. Moses, I'm sorry, Moses from Egypt learned from the Ethiopians. The Bible has been diluted and white and if, I, if that's the word, has been white and white and white, and it continues, just, just like they give the German artists gave us a white Jesus with blue eyes and a, and a, and a, and a beard. So um, the Bible as a historical book, the Bible also is the folk tales of the black Ethiopians, of the Jew, the, the Israelites, the black Israelites of Ethiopia, of Egypt. Moses learned all that he learned. The Ten Commandments were ways of living, conduct, ways of conduct. So we can claim the Bible. The Bible, I don't know if there are black scholars here. Black scholars can say, can we write, can go back to the ancient text, and now we can translate them. I have few friends, many friends actually, who are priests. And um, a friend of mine just finished his doctorate in Rome. And this by the second year, he was like, oh my God, oh my God, I'm finding so many lies. I don't know if I want to remain a priest. You see, because as, as part of their studies, they have to learn Greek, 
Greek and also um, Hebrew. And this gentleman here who talks about almost exactly what the, what the gentleman before me spoke of, um, he wrote his book in 1928, and he spent years studying in Israel. I mean, Israel didn't exist by then, but what we call now Israel. But he studied in the Mediterranean in all the ancient texts um, as a French-speaking, Latin-speaking person who have learned Greek and Hebrew. So, um, and he also did many years in Egypt studying the ancient hieroglyphic text. So this is where we need to stand up and say, you know what, we're going to claim this Bible as our history books. As a, I'm sorry, our history book. So, but anyway, um, unfortunately, all these books are in French, but um, no English <laughs> version. But um, so anyway, some of them were written in 1800, 1885, 1928. Interesting. Um, so, okay, thank you. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, one more question, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I have something to say in regard to your professor's paper. Mm -hmm. um, it, it might interest him or you to know that only a few Jewish people, and I'm Jewish, um, these days would say that the Old Testament or the Exodus story uh, is telling the story of God's deeds. Uh, rather, most people would interpret the Old Testament as the story of a people's searching for God. Not God's words, but their attempt to understand God, and that in fact the God, the warrior God of Exodus is a very primitive notion of what a God would be. Mm. Uh, and as time went on, it advanced to ideas of justice and, and so on. Um, so to me, it's a little unnerving if the conversation is still about whether th these are the historical acts of God. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will uh, pass that on to him. I'm sure he'll be um, interested. Um, thank you. Yeah, um, do you want to take one more question? Sure. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Sure. Uh, I wonder, did, um, did William R. Jones ever meet William Augustus Jones? All right. Um, in terms of the, um, the the Black Liberation theologists, mm -hmm. uh, what is the attitude towards Albert Clegg? Ah, Albert Clegg. Yeah, he Jones takes a, a critique of Clegg's work and is got a white racist. They were both, um, you know, coming. I, I want to say of age at the same time, but Clegg being in Detroit and presenting the idea of a physically, um, a, a different image of God as a black God, um, in Jones's estimation, resulted in a sort of quietism that if God is black and black people are all oppressed, then where and then how in what light do we understand God? Um, it, because I believe Clegg's reasoning to, well, one of the reasons to present God as a, a, a black God was to show that God is on the side of the oppressed. Um, Jones, through a philosophical critique, came to the conclusion that that, um, that falls short, that since this idea of theodicy is still present and God's traditional attributes of being, you know, all-knowing, all-good still don't um, make sense with the maldistribution of suffering of the black um, community. But he does mention, and he has a chapter on Clegg in the book. Well, well uh, I really appreciate all the scholarship, and I would love to see your paper because I could then take it apart by part. But it's great work. 
Thank you, thank you. Thank you, so can we give a round for both the speakers this morning? A applause. Thank you, Eileen. Yeah, thank you. So um, we will be meeting again at 1.30. So do you wanna say any closing words, Dr. Green, before we take our break? I just want to say thanks to everybody who have been part of the morning session. Very, very, very enlightening and very informative. And uh, I personally have learned a lot from all the presentations. There are some uh, informa there are information outside as to if you want to go to restaurants or other eating place. There are some uh, little booklets there that you can make your choice. So um, I hope to see you after lunch to continue this very uh, wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you. So please come back at 1.30.
Sim.
scholarship. Yeah. 
is uh, is the marvelous artistic way, which here is the way. I think we are going to start our afternoon session with uh, those we have here. <laughs> I'd like to welcome you again uh, to this gathering and the Philosophical Theologies, Philosophy of Religion in Africana Traditions. We had a very good morning and um, I can assure you the afternoon with it will be just as good, if not better. <clears throat> and um, so welcome, and I'm very pleased to see those of you who are here. And um, if you could uh, sign the sheet before you leave that we can keep in touch with you, <clears throat> I'd be very grateful. Now I would um, ask the most venerable <laughs> professor from Kirkland, from Hunter, and the Graduate Center to come forward. Uh, Professor from Kirkland is one of the most well-known and erudite scholar in the African-American philosophy. He has uh, written extensively in this area. And I can remember many, many years ago his whole very interesting and informative um, writings and uh, black and modernity. <laughs> and <clears throat> um, Professor Kirkland was the, many years ago when I started the philosophy bound of struggle, Professor Frank Kirkland was the first speaker. He, op <clears throat> he 
he was the one who led the way for the development of uh, that um, uh, organization. And so it is, uh, it is even a greater honor for me to introduce him to you today, to be uh, one of the first in this new venture. And so I would like to, to with great pleasure, great honor, that I, that I inter introduce to you uh, Professor Frank Kirkland. I just met one of his students, uh, former student a few days ago, who is actually now the chair of a division <laughs> in which I'm teaching. And um, he said, do you know that guy? I said, yes, I do. <laughs> the one and only Professor Frank Kirkland. <laughs> and uh, he was so excited that he was going to, that uh, Professor Kirkland was going to be speaking at uh, this uh, gathering today. <clears throat> So now, without any further ado, I would like to introduce to you Professor Frank Kirkland, who will speak on with what Alexander Kamel's conception of black nationalism begins and ends. Professor Kirkland. Thank you ever for the kind introduction. Um, this is a draft, and um, trying to, to distinguish various aspects of Alexander Crummel's thought. Uh, there's a tendency when people write about him. Um, uh, unless you're a historian, where you basically can demarcate his life, um, when you attempt to conceptualize what's going on in there, like, for example, when Anthony Appiah writes on Crummel, or when he used to write on Crummel, I should say, um, Professor Appiah would basically categorize his entire thought in terms of one concept and a concept that has led most scholars in the African tradition to talk about essentializing race. And so that Crummel is regarded as one of the first, the foremost thinkers who essentialize a race concept, which, for those of you in the know, uh, recognize that uh, that is eventually a no-no. It basically created a certain sub-aspect of the, of the uh, discipline. Um, prior to Anthony, there was no such thing as the metaphysics of race. Everything was done according to the issue of politics, society, integration, separatism, so on and so forth. Uh, no one really asked the question, we have to know what we mean by race in order to understand what we're going to do politically. Well, with Anthony, uh, and the whole question of essentializing race, the question had to be addressed first before you talked about politics. <clears throat> uh, and that pretty much has been the field, been the, the orientation of the field since uh, 1989, right? So um, in any case, uh, I'm not one of those who buys into the question of essentializing race. Um, so uh, this required uh, my having to go more close, look more closely into Crummel's thought. Uh, Crummel is difficult by virtue of the fact that Crummel is not a philosopher. Um, I mean, and technically speaking, he's not really a thinker. He's an evangelist. And we should keep that distinction very much in mind. Um, his contemporary and his nemesis, Frederick Douglass, right, was more of a thinker than he uh, was never an evangelist. But those are two ways to kind of separate those two. Um, so what I've eventually done is kind of divide 
the orientation of Kremlin's nationalism as it's coupled with his evangelicism. Um, hopefully, it'll create certain kinds of uh, discussion, especially insofar as uh, Kremlin believed that he was never engaged in colonization, never engaged in colonization schemes. And if you are a person who, who thinks that evangelic, evangelicism works hand in glove with colonization, then you have something to fight over, right? I leave that question up to the audience on how they want to resolve it. <coughs> Be that as it may. It is commonplace to regard Alexander Crummel as one of the initial proponents of black nationalism in its classic form. According to the Dorian of scholarship on black nationalism generally, and on Crummel particularly, William J. Moses, uh, Crummel, quote, became an unmitigated villain from the perspective of 20th century liberalism for being neither democratic, nor multicultural, nor adequately feminist, nor adequately feminist. <laughs> but Cuomo's villainy may not stem from his anti-democratic, his anti-multicultural, multicultural or improperly framed feminist stances. It may rather be due to his favorable adoption of nationalism over two other political theoretical frameworks, liberalism and socialism. <clears throat> All three of them have been individually meaningful, but amongst themselves, they are strongly contested frameworks of modern political life over the pa and have been over the past two, two and a half centuries. <clears throat> Briefly and without nuance, liberalism gives paramount worth to, the in to individual liberty for the state to ensure social equality and justice in principle for the pursuit of individual happiness. Socialism extends significance to struggles around class interests and to labor's emancipatory potential for the state to ensure widespread satisfactory material conditions and outcomes for the sake of reaching social justice and equality collectively. But nationalism emphasizes a people's own demand for the emergence, maintenance, and independence of their own nation state for upholding social equality, justice, and the maintenance and independence of, uh, for upholding social equality and justice and a people's national identity. Its desirability and durability is sustained by those who believe, A, that their own distinctive political and cultural expression is harmed either by intrusively alien norms or by foreclosure to their own territory for such expression, and B, that individual liberty or class struggles are marginal to both repairing that harm and acquiring social equality and justice without the desideratum of, of uh, their own nation state shaped by their own norms and marks of identity. In effect, this comprises nationalism in quote unquote, its classic form. This form brings to light black nationalism as a part of the extension, so to speak, of nationalism, generally. Under this form, black people then would be identified in terms of a long-standing distinctiveness and purity of its ancestry as a group on which the fulfillment of its cultural and political aspirations through the control and defense of its nation state's jurisdiction is conserved. Now add to that the evangelicism Cromwell brought to his conception of black nationalism. Different faith traditions, such as Islam, were indeed put into the mix that was called black nationalism. Yet the manner in which Cromwell's evangelicism and his nationalism eventually modified each other over time is what is distinctive about his thought. <laughs> By 18, uh, herein lies the rub. By 1875, well, let me, Go back a bit. Between 1853 and, 1860 and 1862, Crummel was a pure, straightforward evangelicist. He was a missionary, and he was looking to evangelize, and, and evangelize right, Africans 
on the continent. That's what it's geared toward. That changes. By 1860, uh, on 1862 to about 1875, he is now linking his, his evangelicalism to a nationalism. He's linking it to Liberia. And he's not talking about people indigenous to Liberia. He's talking about emigrating blacks to Nigeria to become citizens. So that the question of that transformation of coming to Liberia as part of an evangelical process is different from the first stage. Whereas before, there's no idea of a nation state to which evangelicalism was to be played out. Finally, between 1873 and his death, 1898, Cromwell leaves Liberia, failed. There's no nation state by which you can call, right, uh, where he's an evangelicized black people within the nation state of Liberia. However, he does not give up on his nationalism. The nationalism now an idea. Furthermore, the nationalism is not no longer tied to anything political. It is now tied to the issue of some kind of social uplift, wherein black people individually must be, quote unquote, civilized, evangelicized. That is to say, you're, you're becoming evangelicized for the sake of becoming civilized. Where he ends up making the case that now civilization is not part of the nation state. Civilization is now you're uh, obtaining the characteristics and, and uh, competence to engage in noble thought, to be chased. Uh, to be refined, so on and so forth. It's that third stage, if you think about it, why someone like W.E.B. Du Bois could write about Crummel in his Souls of Black Folk. No way, no how is Du Bois evangelical. But he adopts Crummel, right, as if Crummel is the predecessor of his early work, especially Conservation of Races. Conservation of Race. So what I want to do is kind of chart that development, right, in Cromwell's thought, so that you can see, right, that there's some movement there. Now, I end up making the case, right, uh, that Cromwell is not really a thinker, that Cromwell is primarily evangelical. Anyone who knows anything about his life, knows that despite the fact that he was Cambridge educated, uh, the Cambridge education was more to serve his uh, uh, dedication to being evangelical, right? Was not there to be a major thinker. Uh, this would be, let's say, put in, in context when you compare him with Frederick Douglass um, early on in Frederick Douglass's life, um, everyone knows that Doug, at that time, Douglass was what they were ref once referred to as a Garrisonian, a Garrisonian abolitionist. It's better to understand what that means. It means that Douglass basically saw abolition as strictly carried out morally and religiously. There was no political abolition. There was always moral abolition. Uh, let me try to give you some quotes, right? And this is between 18, Douglas between 1841 to about 1847, till he changed, right? Here's one quote. Uh, he's in Ireland at the time, and he states, quote, we would not ask you to interfere with the politics of America or invoke your military aid to put down American slavery. No, we only demand your moral and religious influence on the slaveholder, and believe me, that, and believe me, the effects of that influence will be, in, will be overwhelming, end quote. He says again, quote, truth needs but little argument, and no long drawn metaphysical detail to establish a position. There is something in the heart which instantly responds to the voice, end quote. 
Or, finally, where Douglas says, would you have cast your men to ballots? You have not reached slavery as evil. It has fastened its roots deep into the heart of the nation, and nothing but God's truth and love can cleanse the land. We must change the moral sentiment. What is going on there is Douglas is adopting between 1841 to about 1847, a theory of moral sentiments, where it's believed that human nature is, uh, is intrinsically good, and that what needs to be done is to tap into that sentiment, right? And that people will come through their own devices to recognize they have the sentiment. And if that sentiment can be reached and touched, then the hearts and the minds of slaveholders in this space will be changed. Garrison believed it. Douglas believed it. It's for that very reason why Garrison did not believe in political abolitionism. Right? There's nothing amongst Garrisonians that subscribe to that. But that hooks Douglas to a theory. Cromwell was never hooked to a theory. Cromwell was hooked to the issue of basically trying to convert people to Christianity. Right? Douglas wasn't into conversion. Cromwell was. Right? So that's the big difference between the two of them. Right? Um, in any case. Um, when you read Cromwell the way in which I'm reading him, right? you end up recognizing that he surrenders the desideratum of achieving a black or African nation state. Yet he still endorsed the idea of black nationalism to his death in 1898. Furthermore, what's interesting is that Cromwell regarded black people not as self-determining agents. Self-determination was never uh, an issue, right, in the manner in which Cromwell always referred to black people. Rather, he basically saw them as imitating, as being imitated, that they have the capacity to imitate the manners, mores, and customs, or the habits of civilization, right? So that once you know that, all you have to do is put in front of them, right, the question of what those habits must be, and black people will imitate those habits without question. But with that imitation, he was endorsing black nationalism. So we have a tendency to always link black nationalism to some kind of self-determining moment, when with Cromwell, that self-determining moment is never there, never there in his thought. And then finally, recent criticism, I said before, has found fault with black nationalism as a cultural political stance preserving an essentialized black or racial identity for supposedly delimiting the cultural and political aims of black people. But a racial essence would be the quote unquote metaphysical inner integral substance of group. That is what is ontologically perennial to it, not what is historically cogent and phenomenal to it like its habits and customs. It is supposedly obtained by discovering substance through erroneous, erroneous premises and methods believed to be of a natural science, biology, to identify and chart a group of substance via outer accidental features, rather than by its actions as expressive of that group and its members. So does black national, Cromwell's black nationalism commit him to the endorsement of such a science? that correlates the way in which the inner or central character of black people in general is necessarily and sufficiently expressed in their outer observable traits of behavior? My answer to that question is no, and I'll show that as we move along. In keeping with the scene setting and the issues I mentioned above, I shall address the following questions. Why does Musk promote embrace black nationalism over liberalism or socialism? Two, why does Musk Cromwell believe black nationalism remains cogent and intact as a notion, even if the desideratum of black nation state is ultimately dropped? Three, why does Musk the idea of self-determination become, for Cromwell, impertinent? 
to the civilized intensity of black people? And four, is racial essentialism important to crumble black nationalism? Many, uh, as I move on, many have already pointed out what they take to be contradictions in Cromwell's thought when he blends his conception of civilization and his conception of black nationalism. One certainly can understand the former conception without the latter and vice versa. But the problem does not lie between the two conceptions as contradictory. Rather, it lies within a misleading manner Cromwell delineates and construes the orientation of his nationalism. Prior to 1872 or so, Cromwell's position has the desideratum of a nation state in which black people are literally characterized by an essentialized identity obtained personhood as citizenship through political education in line with the civilizational mission. Citizenship of black people in their own nation state would then be for Cromwell concomitant with both their personhood and entry into civilization. However, from 1872 onward, Cromwell's position, previous position changes. It rather bears the desideratum for black people to obtain personhood not through political education, but through social education, a tune with entry into civilization and citizenship through political education upholding personhood as an explicitly stated goal or guarantee. <coughs> Excuse me. Citizen, citizenship of black people in their own nation state gives pride a place to their acquisition of personhood and entry into civilization. This changing of lanes, so to speak, in Cromwell's thought requires explanation. Cromwell's earlier position entails that in, acqu in acquiring citizenship in their own nation state, black people will find respectability in identifying themselves as members of a political community that itself would duly charge the highest of their regard and fidelity. Citizens of Liberia gain regard simply by belonging to a, a particular people and participating in Liberia's civic and economic life. To bear the characterization, oh, I'm sorry, to bear the characterization, say, Liberian, was in Cromwell's mind a distinction for black people because of the state stature Liberia would have for them as political members thereof. This is what motivated Cromwell's fierce political opposition to any agenda making or regarding Liberia as a settler colony rather than a nation state. He was always fighting that battle. He never won it, but he was, always fighting. he was always fighting it. But my focus is not about the details of the real politic, which Cromwell strategically and tactically, tactically addressed, albeit unsuccessfully. It is rather his theoretical account and endorsement of his black nationalism. Oh, Annie, too. <laughs> By establishing black people's identification through their fidelity to their own nation state, Cromwell is suggesting that being black is not an identification ascribed to an ontologically defined racial essence, but a normative, but a normative outlook giving service to a specific practical identity, namely, in this case, Liberian. This kind of identification is acquired through a kind of political education in which the fidelity to the norm to black people as citizens of their own nation state is the most significant value. It is the kind of education wherein the formation of blacks as persons is wholly concurrent and congruent with their formation as citizens. Blacks are persons only when they are citizens. I repeat, Blacks are persons only when they are citizens. Be very careful with that, that notion. <clears throat> their identities as persons are subsumed in full under their, under their membership in a jurisdictionally bound nation state. Cromwell's early account is reliant on this juxtaposition, and it's important to keep this in mind. 
Cromwell's early black nationalism presupposes two things. First, even as emancipated from enslavement in the United States, and immediately thereafter legally transformed as citizens of the United States, black people do not and cannot effectively become citizens thereof. They were declared citizens of the United States, but rendered ineffective to the point that their fellow white citizens had taken blacks' newly declared legal status in the United States as nugatory, if not illegitimate. Effective citizenship is obtained through political education for their own nation state, bearing its own jurisdiction, designating its citizens as civilized, that is, as of noble thought, grand civility, chaste and elevating culture, refinement, and economic self-sufficiency. Secondly, black people's education to become citizens of their nation state bound to its, bound to its jurisdiction simultaneously involves their individually aesthetic and effective rapport with each other as a political community. It does not deliver the idea that the significance of each individual's aesthetic judgment of oneself and each other's personhood may fall outside the goal of political education, making them citizens. The political education of black people, relevant for the good of their citizenship, is regarded as both fully representative of and simultaneous with, not atypical of, whatever is their social education relevant for the good of each black individual's personhood. If this is the case, however, Cromwell's early black nationalism is reliant on criteria of, ident of identification which defines an individual person only in terms of her citizenship in the state in which she is civilized. Under such criterion, criteria, black folk would be regarded as, quote unquote, moving outward from, not inward to themselves, to feel themselves in others, to care for a larger good, to gain social standing from others by acknowledging their effective bonding, completely infidelity, with their membership in their own political community. They would consider themselves exclusively, or at least primarily, as citizens in, of, and to their own nation state. The private disposition of an individual would be irrelevant, or at least ancillary, to defining his or her personhood. However, under another set of criteria, an individual's personhood recognized as a citizen of one's nation state would not be dismissed, but it would not be wholly subsumed under that citizenship. Rather, it would be realized in terms of an individual valuing herself as a person whose citizenship relies on her insight on her capacity to impute to herself her own reasons into the legitimacy of the nation state and its laws, norms that obligate her. Her personhood, uh, on, on the earlier notion, once a black person's personhood would emerge entirely with her citizenship to the sovereignty of the state. There would be, there would be no sovereignty of personhood outside of citizenship. However, after 1875, the sovereignty of the state would underwrite the sovereignty of each individual's personhood outside of citizenship in order for each to recognize the collective aim of the nation state as her own aim. Cromwell's later black nationalism, which is post-1872, is affected by this distinction. Be mindful, at this time, his theoretical and political focus no longer accommodates the idea of a black nation state. It now attends to the socially educational uplift of African Americans. This is not to say that such uplift was not an important part of Cromwell's early black nationalism but it was always in conjunction with the affirmation of a black nation state. 
Nonetheless, his later discussion of that uplift not only says nary a word about a black nation state, but in a way also nary a word regarding their lack of effective citizenship in the United States. He does not argue for their political education to achieve an effective citizenship in their own nation state in Africa or in the United States. Rather, he's intensely supportive of their socially educational uplift to achieve for each of them personhood as a sufficient mark of civilization. Crumble appears, appears not to be bound to a black nationalism generally distinguished by whether it is classical or pragmatic, as, Shelby, as Tommy Shelby and Eddie Glaude have characterized black nationalism. These are two contemporary renditions of what counts as black nationalism. Rather, he appears tied to a black nationalism distinguished between the political educational goal of citizenship and the social educational goal of personhood. But it's important to pay close attention to these two distinctions. The former represents two alternative versions of black nationalism, with both Shelby and Glaude each holding their own interpretation for the pragmatic or instrumental strategic version as the manner black nationalism is to be construed. So if you watch, if you, if you read Glaude and Shelby, they're making the case that the only way that black nationalism makes sense is strategic, is instrumental, right? There's nothing normative or moral or intrinsically worthy to it. That's why they will go for the pragmatic one. My distinction, on the other hand, does not automatically signal alternatives to each other, but speaks to two different yet complementary goals. The politically educational goal of black nationalism is the inculcation of black people effectively bonded with each other to effective citizenship full stop in their own nation state. Fidelity to one's social identity and person is completely absorbed therein. It's completely converged with citizenship. Citizenship in such a nation state would be purchased at their expense. Under a socially educational goal, black nationalism produces black individuals as persons whose intellect and temperament are developed sufficient for them to resist being compelled always to act or to judge in ways even kindred others see fit to serve effectively as citizens in the nation state. The socially educational goal of personhood precedes, yet is supported by the politi political educational goal of citizenship. In the former, a black person's citizenship, citizenship wholly converges with her identity as a person. In the latter, a black person's citizenship is reliant on a black individual's allegiance to her own person to determine that and how her effective citizenship is not at odds with that allegiance. Why did Cromwell's black nationalism undergo the switch from the earlier to the later position? If Shelby and Glaude are right, then Cromwell's switch is due to his affirmation of black nationalism as more instrumental and strategic than unconditionally and intrinsically normative. A black nation state would be less the moral end in itself and thereby less the moral end to be unconditionally promoted than it would be a goal among others and measured in terms of the feasibility to achieve it rather than to achieve others. Cromwell's switch would appear then to represent his commitment to a more strategic and less normative conception of black nationalism. But Cromwell's switch may come with his recognition that his earlier black nationalist view sustains a category mistake. The earlier position employs what you can call pre-modern political education in which the goal is for any black individual's personhood to converge entirely with citizenship in her own nation state. But this claim runs counter to a black nationalism under a modern point of view. Citizens in a modern context generally conceive of themselves as individual persons. First and foremost, an individual's commitment 
to citizenship on the basis of their socially obtained competence to consent politically to the laws that obligate them. Their political education would be pre-modern if, as individuals, they were bound uh, to understand that they were immediately and effectively bearers of the politically general will of their state. The latter position, on the other hand, utilizes a modern social education in which the goal is for any black individual person, personhood to flourish and eventually to inform constantly her citizenship in general. The goal of this social education is both distinct from and yet in accord with a citizenship consistent with a black individual's personhood. A black nationalism would have to be modern in that way. This position is representative of Cromwell's post-1872 black nationalism. Now stop there. Thank you. Let's go. Are there questions? Ah, OK. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, Professor, such a mighty strong work. I would like to I have it in front of me, so read it and then get a whole lot okay. more out of it before phrasing the question. But the first one that comes to mind is how it squares with um, Tony's statement that, um, with um, Judge Roger B. Tony's statement at the uh, Dred Scott decision, the black man has no rights and the white man is bound to respect. Um, how that would play into a desire of black nationalism when in today's, well, to my ears, to, to invoke black nationalism, you were talking about black self-determination. Um, but I am understanding you to say that uh, Cromwell, Cromwell, he was only referring to Liberia, not anything about any states here in America, which sometimes makes us regret that, that we, uh, did, that, 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 <coughs> that we didn't really focus on the states here in America and then see where those theories of, of black nationalism would have gone. Um, so, uh, 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 I'm still trying to square how he could have even conceived of it uh, with the prevailing attitude that was here in America. Okay, okay, uh, okay. First of all, um, given your reference to uh, the Dred Scott decision, that would have been for uh, Crummel, the motivational impetus for why you would emigrate. Why you wouldn't even go to, to Liberia? Because you can never be effective citizens in the United States. He was identifying, all right, before, as I said, prior to about 1862, he was a pure, a straight up evangelical missionary. He was looking to convert, quote unquote, the pagans in Africa. All right? But he ends up, trying to nation build in Liberia. And that nation building requires an emigration of free blacks, right, to come over to help with that missionary, with that, with that aim, okay? Now, when you do that, then that means that he is promising those who emigrate, right, 
that they then become identified as citizens where they could never do that anywhere in the Western world. Okay? So, the idea of a nation state, right, is something that he has in his head, and Liberia is it. Now, he doesn't succeed, even though he tries, right? He had his own temperament. We don't have to go into that. All I'm talking about is what was motivationally driving him, okay? But this was an issue that would always put him in opposition, for example, with Douglas, because Douglas and the abolitionists were not immigrationists. Cromwell may not have been a colonizationist, he, and definitely he was always fighting against that. And I said, that's an issue that uh, you folks can argue insofar as can an evangelical missionary on the continent not be working hand in glove with colonizationists. Okay, I mean, that's subject to debate, right? But Cromwell always believed that he wasn't doing that, okay? Um, but the issue is, is that this is what kind of put kind of the, the split between a person like Crummel and a person like Douglas, right? And so it becomes very interesting post-1872 when they're back together again in the United States and they have that change in orientation, right, with regard to how you deal with blacks. Right? How you un how you going to understand them? Right? And so that for Douglas, after the war, right, for him, quote unquote, the struggle for the most part, right, in terms of black people being black people, is for him gone. You're now concerned with them as individuals. Crummel to his death, to his grave, said it was n no way in hell you could n ever have a black person forget that he's black. So that was always a bone of contention between the two. The other thing would be Douglas was of the mind that uh, uh, black folk, uh, regardless of the condition, this is the quote, everything was okay. Whereas Crummel would be arguing for the socially educational uplift of black folk and that you could not say that Black people, all okay. Okay? And so, and, but my issue with this is basically making the distinction between a political education where your personhood is fully subsumed by your citizenship and a conception of personhood which serves as a condition for you entering the citizenship. Crummel was doing, uh, you can understand Crummel as doing one and shifting to the other. Can you speak a little more on, or, or give us a little more context of Crummel in terms of uh, Du Bois' thoughts and even to Derek Bell and, and how those two um, thought leaders dealt with these differences between Crummel and, and Douglas that you just spoke about? Well, the, um, the issue is just that there's no way Du Bois could have even embraced Crummel if Crummel had not made that switch of dealing with socially educational uplift, right, for black folk, right? Because uh, Du Bois was definitely not evangelical, right? And so that if Crummel had stayed stuck in either the first, earlier position or the second position, I doubt that you would get Du Bois writing a chapter on Crummel in the Souls of Black Folk, I doubt that you would have Crummel instituting something called the Negro, American Negro Academy, of which Du Bois was a part, right, in 1897, right? Those are, those are consistent with, with socially educational uplift, right? Where you're now making the case that in order for the evangelical or the civilizational mission to occur, you need to have agents 
that are educated in art, philosophy, history, you name it. Not just industrial education. So you got the Booker T. Washington thing going on there too, right? <clears throat> Cuomo, indeed, wanted industrial education, but never at the expense of what, for him, was essential to civilization. And that was that kind of social educational uplift by which right, you get this idea of working on the, uh, the mores, customs, and habit, educational habits of individual black people, right? And Cuomo was definitely for that after 1875. So that for him, that counted as the nationalism, not the idea of a nation state. Whereas prior to that, the issue of the idea of a nation state was serving the evangelism, right? Was serving it, right? And I doubt that you would get the boys lining up with that. I can't really speak to Derek Bell, so I can't answer you that question, that component of your question. Um, it would appear to me that between Bell, if I had to push it, and someone like Crummel, is that for Bell, uh, you take this position. Bell is of the mind, right, that given the history uh, and the circumstances and the manner in which black people have lived, there is no way a black person can cogently frame that there will be beneficial results that will come to him or her in the long run. He denies that. Crummel would never deny it. Crummel would make the case that there you could anticipate, despite the history, you could anticipate that beneficial results would accrue to you in the long run. Is that because it's evangelical? That, well, you, can, you, don't, you don't have to be an evangelical to hold on to it. Right? I, you could even argue... Um, even someone like Malcolm X learned how to adopt, to accept that, right? If we're talking now more contemporary, King definitely accepted it, Douglas accepted it. I would even argue Du Bois accepted it, right? Bell is distinctive by virtue of the fact that um, given that history, he does not believe that no black person in his or her right mind could ever anticipate anything uh, beneficial coming to him or her in the long run. Hence the reason why, why he's always talking, why Bell would always be talking about uh, racism being so persistent, or oppression being so persistent that really nothing can be done to override it. I was hoping that you might give us um, a little more historical context as to why um, Cromwell returned back to the United States from Liberia. Because he, uh, the real politics, the real politics mm. that, was, that he was engaged in in order to build nation bill failed. Um, was there... The, the, 